Hello guys and welcome to the Stardom Cast, your weekly audio source of all things World Wonder Ring Stardom. I'm your host, Rob Goodwin, and I am joined by my co-host, Matt Turner. Matt Turner, how are you, good sir? Rob Goodwin, I am phenomenal, my man, as we're recording this. It is October 1st, so we are rocking and rolling through the phenomenal year that is 2024, but I'm fantastic. I'm excited to talk about this really good Cork and Hall show. I'm excited to preview another loaded pay-per-view from Stardom, and I'm just as excited as I am to talk about this uh, pay-per-view. I'm just as excited to talk about maybe the greatest performance in the history of the Stardom Cast press conference <laughs> from one timeless Tony Storm. Boy, howdy, she was laying it on, and, uh, you know, obviously made mentions to us so again we'll get into it but brother i'm doing well how's everything with you how are you feeling are the ribs getting any better sir that's what the public wants to know so we need to know buddy are we are we getting any better yeah slowly but surely we are getting better which is uh which is obviously a positive um i didn't realize so i had a biology lesson from uh, kirsty and what i should preface this by saying is that my early desire was to be a doctor um and i was very convinced that that was where i was going to go um then i took biology and was bloody crap at it so obviously didn't become a doctor anyway um i found out that there are actually more ribs in the human body than i realized so uh yeah it turns out that it's one of the floating ones at the back um that i've done so uh because kirsty was like yeah everyone has these weird ribs i was like no they don't she was like why would i lie about that i was like you're having me on and uh, now now it turns out that i've gone through my entire adult life i'm 34 years old not realizing that you had floating ribs underneath your actual rib cage so uh there you go a little bit of a biology lesson for you <laughs> Rob, I only knew about floating ribs when I started taking catch wrestling because you digging your, <laughs> yeah. your you digging see, it all comes back to wrestling because you digging your knuckles into somebody's floating ribs opens up a world of trouble for arm bars. So uh there you <laughs> another go. podcast for another day, or maybe that might be a, Ve- a drunken Vegas discussion in a couple of months. But see that my man, but the the more we know, we just continue to keep bonding together here on the Stardom Cast, my friend. <laughs> Absolutely. But on the plus side, there was no animals delivered to the house, courtesy of Fred or George, like there was yesterday morning when we recorded the alternate commentary where uh, I had a real morning. But no, it's uh, it's getting better. Um, I got slightly more sleep, um, which is always a bonus. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm getting there. Uh, hopefully, back in uh, back in football action in two weeks or just over two weeks. That's that's the current prognosis. Whether that actually happens or whether I find another ingenious way of breaking a different bone in my body, I don't know. But uh, yeah, all, uh, all looking okay here. But yeah, apart from that, everything is good. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today, Matt. Considering we have only got the Corican Hall show and New Blood 15 to talk about, as you mentioned, Tony Storm decided to make the most gif-worthy um stardom press conference perhaps ever um just some absolutely incredible one-liners um and we'll be talking about the rest of the uh rest of the press conference as well we've had the full nagoya golden fight show announced as you would hope with the pay-per-view being saturday um we'll go into that and obviously we'll have our preview at the end of this episode we've got a whole world of news and um, we've got goddess of champion goddess of stardom championship match to talk about rena's continued reign as the future of stardom champion and all that good stuff as well it just keeps on going however matt um one bit of news in the goodwin household um is that my mum now my mum isn't very well at the moment bless her um but she's getting better um and she decided today that she was so bored um that i got a text to say i'm listening to a podcast and me being me was like oh what type of podcast assuming it would be something about knitting um but no no it turns out she listened to the last episode we did which was uh the nights five six and seven i believe of uh, the dream star grand prix now bearing in mind that this woman knows very very little about wrestling um uh, 
I was intrigued to know what she thought. She found it very entertaining. She laughed every time we said Bozilla um, because she found <laughs> she found the name entertaining. Um, she doesn't think, and she said this, layered, layered with heavy sarcasm. She doesn't think that we put enough emphasis on Marigold bringing the baseball shirts over, so thinks we need to do a better job <laughs> of that. She said, you only mentioned it about 14 times. So uh, we need to make that a thing now on every single podcast we do, just in case Deal. just in case <laughs> someone from Marigold is listening, we uh, we need to get that sorted. But yes, um, if if Big Mama Goodwin is listening to this, then hello, Mum. How, how are you doing? Hope you're feeling better. Um, but apart from that, Mr. Turner, why don't you regale our lovely fans by telling us what is coming up on our Patreon this week? On our Patreon, we finish high speed. Mo- well, we will finish high speed month uh, at by the end of this week. But our final alternate commentary was an absolute hidden gem. One of the best high speed championship matches I've ever seen. And I've never seen it before. You've never seen it before until we did the alternate commentary as basically maybe the groundbreaker of the high speed division. Natsuko Teo, not, not, not uh, it's easy for me to say, uh, t- challenges, say it with confidence, uh, Matt. Uh, Teo chal- uh, defends the high speed championship against one Io Shirai and an absolute fantastic match. And I only seen a handful of matches from Teo, but watching this match back from you, she does the C4 bomb. She does the May Sarah leg capture Liger bomb. You can tell that the pillars of the high speed division in today's star and the Starlight Kids, the Natsupoys, the Kagamas, the Izumis, and the May Sarahs, they were definitely big fans of one Natsuko Teo. That was an absolutely fantastic match. That was our alternate commentary from this past week that we just dropped. And then we will end the high speed month this weekend as myself and one Mr. Rob Goodwin. We do our round table discussion of our top five all-time favorite high-speed championship match. And then that will take us into the month of October, where it is, let me see if I'm saying this right, Gakaku Kitchen month? Did I get that right? Do you know what? If you put enough syllables into it, Matt, it sounds right anyway. So, uh, yeah, it's Guy Kakujin month. Um, thank you to Karen Peterson for uh, for schooling us on uh, on the correct term that should be used for that. Guy Kakujin Kuku- 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 month. I'm just going to mind you. Guy Kakujin month. We go 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 kick kick on. Anywho, so... Uh, we will be doing our alternate commentary that we will be doing for next week. We'll be Mama Watanabe defending the Wonder of Stardom Championship against Jamie Hayter. We also have coming up um, later on in the month with myself and one Andy Hedder. We'll be discussing our top five favorite matches in Stardom that is loaded with some foreign wrestlers. So there's going to be a lot of really good stuff coming up on the month of October for the Stardom Cast Extra. And as always, we say thank you to every single Patreon member. There is so much fantastic stuff, past, present, and future coming up on the Patreon for the Stardom Cast Extra. Yeah, absolutely. And just on uh, just on that, I want to thank Barry420, apologies, who is our latest Patreon. So uh, thank you very much for subscribing again, www.patreon.com forward slash the stardom cast where you can get all of these episodes early and ad free as whole as well as a whole host of other bonus content um let's get into some news then quite a lot to discuss today from the world of stardom and indeed from marigold as well um the first thing that i want to talk about though is unfortunately something a little bit sad is that uh, saki kashima is going to be missing tomorrow as we record so wednesday the 2nd of october she is going to be um absent from the corican hall show um in order to receive treatment for an injury uh, nanami from diana will be competing at the corican hall event um instead um saki has retweeted that announcement and said that she will still be at the signing and she will still be seconding as well but unfortunately she will not be in ring competing um obviously never a good thing to uh to have a wrestler be injured um and obviously we we wish her the best and a speedy recovery matt yeah absolutely again if this is something that it just seems like every week one of the stardom wrestlers are really just any not only the stardom wrestlers but the Marigold wrestlers, they go down with some type of injury. 
but again, it's nice to maybe err on the side of caution, give these wrestlers some time off to rest, to heal their body. And it's nice now that Saki Kashima is still making the trip, you know, for the autograph session and to be seconding the wrestlers. So obviously that, uh, you know, she's injured a little bit banged up. Nice to see that she's taking time off to heal those injuries, but yet still making her commitments to her loyal fan base. So uh, good on Saki Kashima. And yes, I speak for you, myself, and all the fantastic fans of Sardom that when we say get better, high speed, excuse me, low speed queen. <laughs> and I am going to bet you a thousand pounds that she doesn't second um, Lady C. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I will not take that bet, sir. <laughs> no, I'm just checking. Oh, no, she probably will, actually, because they're in an eight-woman. So, uh, yeah, she probably will, unfortunately. So uh, please don't take that bet. Uh, <laughs> moving on to some other news. Obviously, the big news is that Nagoya Golden Fight, the latest stardom pay-per-view, which will be emanating from Aichi, um, is going to be taking place the 5th of October with English commentary, courtesy of friend of the show, Walker Stewart. Um, the matches have been announced for that card, including the return of Dump Matsumoto on the back of the Queen of Villains documentary. She will be teaming with Hate in a 12-woman against EXV. But this is your card. We will give more of an in-depth run-through during our preview at the end of the show. But for now, this is what we have. A high-speed number one contender battle royal, which will see Saki Kashima versus Kagame versus Hina versus Yuna Mizumori versus Momokogo versus Rana Yagami. Really interesting there, actually, to see some uh, less familiar names when it comes to the high-speed division. So that's exciting. Um, we have got a four-way tag match. Meisera and Azumi versus uh, Siori and Lady C versus Seoriano and Ayasuka Cora versus Wingori, Hanan and Saya Ida. Singles match, Sayaka Kurora versus Saya Kamatani, followed by another singles match, Hazuki versus Starlight Kid. Um, a 12-woman tag team match sees the EXV team of Mika, Mina Shirakawa, Zena, Hanako, Rian, and Wakasukiyama taking on the hate team of Natsukatora, Momo Watanabe, Konami, Ruwaka, and members Dap Matsumo Dump Matsumoto and Zap. Um, we've also then got four title matches. Uh, the Future of Stardom Championship. This is obviously containing spoilers for New Blood, so just bear that in mind. Future of Stardom Championship. The champion, Rina, will be taking on the challenger, Miyu Amasaki. Um, IWGP Women's Championship. Obviously, the champion, Mayu Iwatani. Over 500 days, 520 days now into this reign, taking on timeless Tony Storm. Wonder of Stardom Championship match. Natsupoy, the champion, taking on the challenger, Tekla. And then in what I assume is going to be your main event and what should be the main event. World of Stardom Championship match. Tam Nakano, the champion, against Suzu Suzuki. Um, Matt, a couple of things I just want to talk about. Obviously, we will save our preview and our predictions for the end of the show. But shout out to patron um, Steve Kaklamanos, who genuinely, every time he comments, cracks me up. Um, but he actually brought up Mio Amasaki because me and you were so dead set that they were building Hanako to dethrone Rina that we actually completely forgot Mio Amasaki. And it wasn't that I forgot Mio Amasaki. It was more a case of, you know... I thought she'd be going for the artist belts. I assumed that she had not necessarily transcended the division, but sort of had sort of taken her out of that um, and sort of put her in a different division, especially with um, with Neo Genesis being this new hot faction. However, I think Mio Amasaki is a great shout if we are to dethrone Rina here. I'm 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 reticent to say now is the person to dethrone Rina because we've said that a couple of times and Rina has marched through almost the entirety of the Stardom roster at this point. So uh, whether it happens or not, I don't know. However, if we were to take the belt off Rina, I think Miyu Amasaki is a great shout, Matt. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, obviously we'll get into a little more de depth detail when we get into our predictions at the end of the show. There's your listener retentions. Since we're recording this a day earlier, there's no EO and Kyrie watch, but we'll double up for next week. But anywho, yeah, um, we were all dead set on Hanako, and I blame you because you put that into my brain. And <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And then it's like I'm watching New Blood, and I'm like, oh, 
okay, well, this makes sense because one, yeah, you're absolutely right that Neo Genesis is this hot new thing. Miyu Amasaki is fantastic. Again, Rena's blown past this division. It's time for her to go on to other things. And I think the other things right now is with her and Azusa Inaba, maybe build them up in the tag division. And we may mention again, we are, as we're recording this, it's October 1st. We are a few weeks away from the start of the Goddess of Stardom tournament. What is Neo Genesis going to do? Because there's five members in that group. Do we bring over an Anna J or somebody from AEW or maybe somebody from uh, from Sendai Girls or something to team up with another member of uh, Neo Genesis? But it seems to me, and I could be wrong, but the way that it's looking looking that this is going to go is Miyu Amasaki gets the win here, becomes the new future of Stardom champion. Then on some of these uh, shows here, some of these Goddess of Stardom tournament, she can defend that belt, and that frees up the dream team of Starlight Kid and the Zumi, the Eternal Foes, now being a tag team. I think that's the way they're going to go. O2 Line is a great, great team, but if you're looking for something for maybe with a little extra uh, extra sauce on it, a little extra, hmm, that's something, then maybe the, uh, the Star Bomb team of Azumi and Starlight Kid putting them in the tournament. Um, we've seen them do magazine shoots together. We've seen them uh, almost they were, they were teasing, getting fitted for some new uh, new gear. Maybe that's what it was, and maybe that's the way we're going, Rob. Am I looking too far into this, or do you think that Miyu takes the belt, we have Miyu on some defenses during the Goddess tournament, and that'll free up Azumi and Starlight Kid being a team? What do you think, partner? you think that's the way they're going to go, or you just think I'm completely off my rocker? As per usual, I think you're off your rocker anyway, man. I don't think that's <laughs> lo- I don't think that's localized to this. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's it wasn't a, a hot take. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good shout. Obviously, the Goddess of Stardom Tag League starts at the end of this month. I believe the first shows the 26th of October. Um, unlike the five star, you're not going to have many people on the roster spare. Um, simply because by the very definition, there are more people in the tournament. Um, so the likes of Uriah Sakura, Sayaka Karora, um, you know, people like Rian, Wakasuki Armor, Lady C, people who didn't necessarily make it into the five star, will almost definitely be in the Goddess of Stardom Tag League. Um, I would imagine, especially after the victory of New Blood, we'll see Lady C and Ron Yagami tagging together. Um, so I don't think. Miyu doesn't have to be in the tournament to defend the belt. I think she I think we will get some future um defenses during that time. I believe New Blood 16 is actually the day before the owning of the Goddess of Storm Tag League, or it's that sort of that preceding week anyway. So the chances are we will see a defense there anyway. Again, I think Miyu Amasaki is in the tag league. Um whether she's the outlier, I don't know. Um We'll see. We've we've seen before, of course, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter about um, factions. We've seen Jamie Hayter and B. Priestley. They tagged up. They weren't in the same faction. More recently, we saw Hannon and Rena as Oil and Water. They weren't in the same faction. My uh, Sakurai and Mirai teamed up as well last year. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter whether you stay in your faction or not. Whether it changes this year um, under the new leadership, I don't know. But... Um, Long story short, um, I think Mew will be in the tag league, but I think she will be defending the belt. Again, assuming that she takes the belt off Rena, which I think is a very, very big mistake, because every time we've said that, it hasn't happened. So, yeah. <laughs> All of this being said, Rena might retain. Um, and if we were to get Rena and Azusa and Arba in the tag league, I'd be very, very happy with that um speaking of cards being announced um at the sendai girls show on the 27th of september the show where momo watanabe and ruaka i believe were on the show um the team of chihiro hashimoto and you won the sendai girls world tag team titles and at the end of the show they were challenged by BMI 2000, Ruaka and Natsuka Tora for those belts. And on Mako Satomura's next Sendai Girls show on the Retirement Road, um, we have the following 
card. Um, so it will be Miyake Takase versus Yuna, Zones and Hiroya Masamoto versus Ryo Mizunami and Manami, Chichi versus Mika Iwata, Mia Momono and Eureka Oka versus Mako Satomura and Dash Chisako. And then in your main event, the Sendai Girls World Tag Team Championships, the champions team 200 kilograms, Chihiro Hashimoto and you taking on the team of BMI 2000, Natsuko, Tora, and Ruaka. Matt Turner, that is going to be a very, very, very tasty match. This is going to be, uh, by the way, on the 14th of October in Sapporo. Yeah, again, more of the stardom wrestlers wrestling outside of stardom, especially with Sendai girls. Right? We've seen, I mean, again, we've seen the AW stuff. We've seen the New Japan uh, strong stuff and the New Japan proper stuff from time to time. Obviously, catch the wave, a lot of different promotions. But it really seems like the Sendai girls are the ones that are getting the majority of the stardom wrestlers. And again, Rob, maybe I'm being too greedy. Maybe I'm just hoping. Maybe I'm just hoping, Rob. Maybe my fingers are just crossed and I'm just hoping. But with Mako Satomura doing this big retirement tour, and it seems like the majority of her matches are in Sendai Girls, maybe that's part of the deal where we get Mako Satomura, former World of Stardom champion, and somebody that didn't have a ton of matches in Stardom, but had some of the best matches ever in Stardom with the likes of Kyrie, with the likes of Io Shirai, with the likes of teaming with Kyrie to take on Thunder Rock uh, back in 2016. Man, I hope we get one more time a Mako Satomura match. You know, again, this is this, her big retirement tour. Again, former World of Stardom champion. Maybe this is where it's going. I'm hoping. Regardless, all these girls, fantastic wrestlers on these Sendai Girls shows and Sendai Girls has a really, really underrated roster. There's some fantastic talent there. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, really good for Ruwaka and Natsuko Tour getting a big matchup. Pun, I guess, intended because Shahir Hashimoto and you, those are some big-time players that throw some big-time suplexes. So, yeah, that's going to be a hard, hard-hitting match. So, Rob, I'm going to volley this back to you. One, what do you think about this match? And two, do you think that we get Mako Satomoro back in stardom one more time? Ooh, um... Uh... It's a tricky one. I'd love to see it. Um, does she need to do it? No, I don't think she needs to do it. Um, I think it would be great for us as fans to see it happen, um, especially if she could take on someone you know, who was around at the time that she was in stardom periodically, which pretty much narrows it down to Mayu or Saki Kashima. <laughs> um, oh, no, Saki Kashima had retired at that point. She didn't come back till 2018, so... Yeah, it would just be Mayu. Um, if if that was an option and you were to say to me, do you want to see Mayu versus Mako Satomura? You know, I'm obviously not going to say no to that. Um, obviously, it depends on Mako and what Mako wants to do. Um, in terms of the tag tiles, I think it's going to be a great match. I think we saw what Ruaka could do, and I actually brought this up on the previous Stardom cast as well. We actually saw the potential in Ruwaka when uh, Natsuko and Ruwaka went for the goddess belt against Nanae Takahashi and you. And Ruwaka got a standing ovation in Korokan Hall. So when push comes to shove, as it undoubtedly will in this match, when you look at who's in it, um, I think she will perform. Um, I don't think they take the belts by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to take a couple of people by surprise. Certainly. Um, I mean, just talking about Goddess of Stardom Tag League, we've talked about a partnership with Sendai Girls. Jesus, can you imagine if Team 200 KG came into the Tag League? Christ. Oh. Whoa, Rob Goodwin booking. I just want Azumi and Starlight Kid. Now you're booking you're booking uh, you and uh, Jahira Hashimoto. What's next? And book the Rock and Roll Express in this thing, brother? I mean, go all up. We're already in. Let's go all in, you know? Hell yeah. I mean... Let's face it, we, we we just talked about the partnership between Stardom and Sendai Girls. We've seen Mika Iwata win the uh, Wonder of Stardom Championship. We've seen Sayori Anno win the Sendai Girls World Championship. We've seen almost every big show that Sendai Girls have run, there has been some sort of Stardom participation. Whether it's Members of Hate or whether it's Starlight Kid, Mio Amasaki, there always seems to be someone on there. And just pi- piggybacking on what you said, actually, 
Sendai Girls at the moment is one of the most enjoyable wrestling companies to watch because obviously watching it for the stardom masters that are in it, you do become a little bit more familiar with the Sendai Girls roster and I knew very, very little of Sendai Girls up until, you know, I still know very little, but, um, you know, I didn't watch any either. However, now there are some big time players that if they're on, I'm like, yeah, I'm watching that. Absolutely. Dash Chisako, for example, absolutely fantastic. Now that I've seen more of Mikuri Wata, I think Zones is a really big talent. Um, and then again, t- any time t- Team 200kg are on a card, I'm like, yeah, I am. I am absolutely going to be watching that. I can't wait. So that's going to be really good. That's on the 14th of October, as I mentioned, in Sapporo. So make sure that you check that out. Along the same theme of stardom wrestlers wrestling elsewhere, we talked a couple of weeks ago now that both Mina Shirakawa and Azumi had been announced for the RevPro Global Wars UK show um, in Doncaster, England, October 19th at the Doncaster Dome. Well, the day after, New Japan and RevPro are running Royal Quest 4 on October 20th, and Azumi and Mina Shirakawa have actually just been announced for that show as well, um, with Mina Shirakawa teaming with Kanji, against the team of Azumi and Danny Luna. Danny Luna, of course, being the person that Mina Shirakawa defeated for the Undisputed British Women's Championship. Also announced on that card, you've got Shota Umno versus Callum Newman. You've got uh, Kosai Fujita versus Michael Oku, which is going to be very, very good. Yota Suji versus Drilla Maloney. I know that Zack Sabre Jr. is on that card. I believe he's taking on Sonata. So some really, really, really... Um, exciting matchups on there, but even more exposure, Matt, for uh, for Azumi and for Mina. Yeah, again, doing back to back dates over there in your home country. So we're getting worldwide Mina and uh, British Azumi. What more can you want in 2024? But you're absolutely right. More exposure for two fantastic wrestlers and one Mina Shirakawa and Azumi. So obviously, I'm looking forward to both those shows. My guess. Um, would be sometime, uh, maybe about a week or two after these shows air, that uh, you'll probably see them on Stardom World. Again, that kind of fingers crossed. It's just we've noticed that with these Stardom wrestlers wrestling outside of Stardom, you'll see it after maybe one, two, sometimes three weeks that these matches do pop up on Stardom World, which, again, that's just more content for people to subscribe to Stardom World. And you're absolutely right, partner. The fact that we're getting Mina and Azumi, who primary wrestle uh, in Japan, now that they're going over to England for a few shots. Uh, again, that's just more exposure to two fantastic wrestlers in the Venus and the High Speed Bomb Girl. Changing tack now, going over to Marigold. Um, again, some spoilers for the uh, the fans of the Dream Star Grand Prix. If you haven't already watched this show, maybe skip ahead. Um, however, we've all, by the time this comes out, we will have already dropped our review of that show, so fingers crossed you will have already watched it. But uh, uh, there was also a press conference for that show today um uh, you know we'll do this as a precursor to the uh, to the stardom press conference but there was a press conference where it's announced that utami hayashista has said that she will challenge whoever is the world marigold world champion um on the 3rd of january at marigold first dream at Ota Ward city gymnasium we sort of assume that would be the case matt but that is official now she was presented with a certificate for the right to challenge um, she said that she'll challenge Sari. However, as we're going to talk about in a moment, it might not be Sari, um, but makes sense to have that big challenge there, Matt. Yeah, um, Rob, real quick, I didn't see this press conference, but did by chance Utami, did she was, was she wearing a baseball jersey or did she make mention about selling the baseball jersey jerseys over <laughs> in the United States? I just, we just need to get that clarification, you know, with the stardom cast, the Marigold standard, <laughs> we t- tackle the big issues. This is something that I need to know, Rob Goodwin. So not only enlighten our fantastic listeners of this podcast, but enlighten me, my friend. Was there any baseball jersey talk? Let's uh, let's sell let's sell some jerseys here, brother. Uh, in fact, actually, it was weird because Rossi tried to give her the certificate, and Utami just shrugged him off and went, "No, no, 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 no. We'll do that in a minute. First of all, 
Rob and Matt, we will be bringing baseball jerseys <laughs> over to Las Vegas. Um, and she actually said she gave us free ones as well. It was bizarre. It was like entering the quantum realm. Um, no, unfortunately, there was there was no, there was no mention of baseball jerseys. However, we are going to keep dropping this in periodically, just on the off chance mm-hmm. that someone is able to get us some of those jerseys. Um, but no, and the papas, and the papas. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but yes, um, I like this on a number of levels because a we're building up that anticipation. It's what I love about the G1 Climax, and I know that we aren't getting it this year, but you know that anticipation of, right, we know who is going to be in the main event of Wrestle Kingdom. I like it about the five-star Grand Prix, although we didn't have it this year, of who is going to be in the main event of Dream Queendom at the end of the year. And I do like the fact that here we know that Utami is waiting for whoever is the Marigold World Champion. Now, as we're going to talk about in a moment, we are building to at least one program for Sari. There's obviously quite a few months until January. I think we set up a couple of programs for Sari, certainly um, enough to carry her through to January. Um, but Matt, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, 100%. I like these long builds again growing up in the northeast whoever won the royal rumble you know wwe wwf whoever won the royal rumble you started building two three four months out for that main event match at wrestlemania we would always see with the g1 going into wrestle kingdom obviously that didn't happen this year and the same thing with the five star which one yeah, i get it you have to change things up from time to time but with utami getting this win her basically saying hey i'm waiting until the beginning of the year i'm waiting about you know three months time um for it you know for uh my sh- shot at the championship and you do have some things that utami can do in the next three months and sorry we know we're gonna get sorry and bozilla we know we're probably gonna get sorry and then takahashi or nanai takahashi um i know that please I hope we get that match with uh, Nanai and sorry for the uh, world of started uh, for the, excuse me, for the world of Marigold championship, the red belt. And with Utami losing to Mirai and losing to Nagisa Nozaki, those are matches that you can run back over the next few months. And you can also do a whole bunch of tag stuff as well. So you have enough to keep sorry and Utami high. It's the busy between now and the beginning of next year, setting up that big match. And we kind of figured that's the way they're going to go. And that's pretty much the biggest match that uh, Mary Gold has in their back part yeah. pocket. You're just going to keep building it up more, and it's the right match. I'm assuming now if something crazy happens, Sari is going to be retaining the red belt up until the beginning of the year, and we're finally going to get that big singles dream match of Sari taking on one Utami Hayashista, and the build literally started as a recording today. We're going we're to slow build to this. You have stuff for Utami to do, have her avenge her losses um, that she lost in the Dream Star, and you have two matches pretty much set up with Sari. So great job booking Rossi, not only this tournament, which we'll get into in the Marigold Standard because that final night was unbelievable. Just a great night of wrestling. Mm-hmm. But you set up a lot of things that you'd have your two top stars doing. And then ultimately, you're going to have the crescendo of them finally meeting in a big, big show uh, at Wrestle Kingdom weekend um, Yeah, on the 3rd of January. So excellently well done. And I cannot wait to see that match. And I'm very interesting how else they're going to load that card because you saw what they did at Summer Destiny. You know, you basically had the two main events matches of Sari and Julia and EO versus Utami and they, they loaded that undercard so I'm interested to see how they're going to load that undercard and if they bring any talent in from the WWE to kind of help pack that place uh, what is going to be an absolutely loaded weekend over there in the land of the rising sun my friend yeah absolutely um, I think as well not only does this gap give you chance to sort of really build the anticipation for the Utami match but also it gives you the opportunity to build other stars, to build other programs, because, you know, it will have cost a lot for Marigold to bring over a star of the caliber of EO Sky. And I think there is a misconception that, you know, for every single big show, we're going to have a big name from WWE, you know, because of this partnership. And that's fine to a certain extent, you know, for EO Sky, for example, it was a it was a huge moment. It really was. However, you want to be able to sell tickets on the back of your own roster. And, you know, we talk about it all the time on the Marigold Standard that Utami is one on her own at the moment, with Mirai perhaps just behind. I don't count Sari in that because she's a freelancer. Um 
you want to be able to build the rest of the roster as well so that you know maybe programs with Sari is the way to go obviously i think we can all anticipate that we're going to get bozilla and nana takahashi programs i think that's where we're going we're definitely building towards that bozilla program as i'll go into in a moment but if you can also throw a title defense against the likes of a my sakurai for example or you know something like that and really build a star there as well you're relying less and less on outside talent to sell the tickets um you know you have nailed on got that main event which i i would be amazed if sari drops the belt before first dream amazed um and i don't think she will because sari and utami is a money money match but where else are you going with that okay what else is going to be on that card because there are stars that are definitely higher than they were at Summer Destiny. For example, my Sakurai is completely different than she was at Summer Destiny. Um, I'd argue Koki Amore is bigger than she was at Summer Destiny. You've got Mirai, who seems to get bigger every single every single day, um, and that's just her smile. Um, you know, you've got Bozilla, who's bigger. But if we keep building these up they're going to feel like legitimate stars ahead of this show. And I think that's really, really, really important. Um, Marigold also announced during this press conference that they will have a 2024-25 New Year's countdown show on December the 31st at 10 p.m. at Shinjuku Face in Tokyo. Now, I don't know whether this is just like a meet and greet and things with fans from the fan club or whether this is a legitimate like actual wrestling show it looks like it's been packaged as an actual wrestling show in which case i think that's a really really cool idea matt yeah absolutely i did briefly see that that's an awesome idea what better way to ring in the new year with some fantastic wrestling so i mean you know maybe it's a combination of meet and greet i think that's what they do anyway they always do the meet and greet before the shows it's very uh typical to like what stardom does but um yeah if you do like a meet and greet then have a wrestling show as you're counting down the new year if that starts at 10 o'clock uh, for Japanese time, that would be 9 a.m. my time. So I guess maybe the champagne and the beer is maybe uh, opening a little bit uh, earlier in the Turner household watching that show. But uh, no, I think that's great. And considering the fact that that's that show, which is going to be a fun show because, again, it's Mary Gold and they have fantastic wrestling. And then you're at the end of the year. And that's basically almost like your appetizer, what you're going to get just in a few days afterwards with uh, that uh, that big, big show that they're putting on on the 3rd of January. But yeah, that's really, really cool. A great way to ring in the new year with some fantastic wrestling. And then finally, as I mentioned before, it does seem that we are building towards a Sari and Bozilla program. Um, I imagine, and again, this is pure speculation from me, that that will be at the second of the Corrigan Hall shows during their Fantastic Adventure Tour, which I believe is mid to late October. It's a Thursday. I can't remember exact date off the top of my head. But they have announced some matches to go along with the two title matches for their seventh uh, October 7th Corrigan Hall show, which is this coming Monday. Um, already announced as the Twin Towers versus My Sakurai and Mirai for the Twin Star Championships and Natsumi Shozuki versus Victoria Yuzuki for the Superfly Championship. Just announced we have a Dream Star special match, which sees Misa Matsui take on Chiaki, a tag team match, which sees Rhea Sato, making her in-ring comeback, taking on um, Komomo Minami, uh, sorry, Rhea Sato teaming with Komomo Minami versus Yuki Minami and Myla Grace. Another tag match um, sees Utami and Kazuna Tanaka versus Nanae Tagashi and now Ishikawa, the Passion Sisters. And then a huge match, Sari and Mirai, Sorry, Sari and Miko Aono, I'm reading the thing above this, versus Bozilla and Nagisa Nozaki. Um, Matt, some really interesting matches there added to this Corrigan Hall card. Yeah, you basically have like your main event, like almost like a double main event where your two championships with Natsumi Shozuki versus Yuzuki, which will be really, really good. And then, yeah, you have uh, Chigoto and uh, Kogiyamare challenging uh, Mirai and my Sakurai. And, and considering the fact how hot those four wrestlers are, Again, with Mariah having a really, really good uh, dream star and the fact that she's obviously one half of the uh, tag champs with Mai Sakurai, obviously defending 
on this show. And then my Sakura arrived, making it to the finals of the Dream Star. Who would have predicted that? <clears throat> Anywho, taking on the absolutely white hot team of Koki Amare and Chika Goto. And, uh, you know, obviously the way that they've been able to heat up Koki Amare going into this tournament and then coming out is just absolutely amazing. But getting that big win over Mirai which sets up this match. And considering the fact how over all, all four of these wrestlers are over, especially in Cork and Hall, but she could go to, cause she's got the cool catch raise and she's just so endearing with the crowd. She's massively over in Cork and Hall. I would not be shocked if they pull a title switch. Obviously we'll preview that a little bit more on the Marigold standard, but regardless, another loaded show in Cork and Hall for Marigold and uh, a lot of great wrestling going on in Cork and Hall, especially for uh, what we get to watch, my friend. I wonder though, if, you know, maybe we should have our own coffee mugs in Cork and Hall, even though we've never been there before. It just seems like the last two months we're watching so much wrestling in Cork and Hall. I feel like that we're kind of already there, buddy. You know, we're already there wearing a slew of different baseball jerseys. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which I believe, which I believe they might be selling in, uh, in the U S <laughs> of Vegas. Again, going to bring it all yes, back. Of Vegas. And again, I know that listeners by the end of like November are going to be like, shut up about the baseball jerseys. No, mm-hmm. we sh- we shall not. No, this is purely for me and Matt, purely for me and Matt. No, and you know what else is for me and you, buddy? Don't forget, go to Amazon.com and buy Rob Goodwin's two book, Chasing the Dream <laughs> and Living the Dream, because I have not placed to plug that all the time. And now, since we're back in plugging mode, I figured <laughs> let's just go back. Let's go back into the vault, my friend, and let's plug Rob's good Rob's books. <laughs> Absolutely, go old school. Why not? Um, I suppose we should probably start talking about these two shows. Um, we're going to start with the Corrigan Hall show simply because it's first chronologically. Um, but we have had two shows. Um, first, Stardom in Corrigan 2024 September. Two from the 28th of September 2024. It was live on Stardom World. 1,176 people in attendance. Now, a couple of things to note about this. That makes it the fourth Corrigan Hall show in a row for Stardom to pass the 1,000 people mark. It's up from the last time they ran Corrigan on the 8th of September when they drew 1,022. And something that's really interesting, actually, from Armani Shoe Exchange, our friend Armani over on Twitter, they've said, here's a good stat. Stardom's Saturday Corrigan show, which is the one we're talking about today, was the third highest attendance they've had for a normal, in inverted commas, Corrigan show since the start of COVID. Now, Armani takes into account Grand Prix, Cinderella tournament, and retirement or farewell shows as bigger shows and not normal Corrigans. So if you are to take those shows out, because, you know, Stardom have ran Corrigan Hall something like 157 times over their over their, uh, over their what you call it, over their history. Um, and this year alone, I think they've ran it something like 12, 13, 14 times. So to say that this is the biggest show or the third biggest attendance taking out of, you know, taking out the dream, the five-star, the Cinderella retirement shows, I think that's a big get for stardom. And uh, it's also, you know, a lot of proof that Tony Storm, the intrigue surrounding Tony Storm as well. I think that was really important for this show. Yeah, you know, I think that for the uh, the five star show, I think they did something like fourteen, fifteen hundred. I uh, mean, it was jam packed. I think they announced it was a sellout. And I was watching the show um, as it happened, so it was like right. I was maybe about two or three matches in, and Andy Hatter actually texted me around midnight our time, uh, and it started I think at ten thirty. He was actually watching it live. And he said, boy, this house is completely packed. I said, yeah, I think this is a sellout. And then about 24 hours later, I got the number. And it's a great number, you know, 1,100 people. But you're telling me that there was over 300 more people at the show about a month or so ago for the five stock. Where was the 300 empty seats, Rob? Because I only saw maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen empty seats. So I don't know if it was scale different or maybe I just wasn't looking because the wrestling was, was terrific. Maybe I just wasn't looking at the seats. But that's the one thing I was like, where is this two to 300 empty seats that I'm not seeing here? But regardless, great show considering the fact that it was really, I mean, it was, it started them. It's great wrestling, right? But considering the fact that it was just, I would, I was, I would say a two match show, but really that, that uh, the stars match with 
that was basically FWC split up and Wingoy split up. It was almost like a three show card. And then you had a tag match, a tag title match. You didn't have a red belt. You didn't have a white belt. You didn't have like a number one contenders thing. It was again, you know, a, a normal show. It wasn't a big farewell show or like a pay-per-view, but considering the fact that we did roughly 1200 people here, that was absolutely fantastic. And they did a great job building up Tony Storm's match with Mayu. And again, something again, I know Andy's listening to the show. Hi Andy. How you doing brother? But, uh, I know me and him were texting back and forth. It was like, I think the reason why Tony came into stardom a week or so earlier than her, than the match that was planned is because she's going to do this match. She's going to do the cork and show coming up here, uh, literally tomorrow, you know, as we're recording, I believe that cork and show is on the 2nd of October. I said, more than likely they're going to do a press conference and even said, Oh boy, I cannot wait to see Tony storm in the press conference, which obviously we'll, uh, we'll get into because boy, howdy was she aces on the, uh, on the press conference from earlier today as we were recording with that, maybe the greatest stardom promo ever. I, I don't know, but regardless, I love how just Tony storm is so in depth into this and to her match with Mayu, making sure she's building it up. You know, a lot of us thought maybe it would just be a one-off because she's a big star on a W TV, but the fact that we're going to be getting at least three matches on this tour from Tony storm. And then I think she's going over to CMLL at the end of the month. I think that's really cool. AEW doesn't have anything for her at this time. They're kind of cooling her down. I'm sure they'll probably bring something back up when the time's right. But what is she doing? She's going back to her roots. She's going back to stardom. And ultimately this really helps sell the tickets here. Almost 1200 people here on a Saturday show. I think it was like Saturday at 10 AM. Really, really good number for stardom. But then again, partner. And again, I'm going to volley this question back at you. Where was the 300 empty seats? Because I just didn't see them. No, it's a very good question. I imagine they were probably on the hard cam side. Um, I know that they closed off the balconies. Um, there was no one on the balconies. But again, who knows? Who knows? I can't see stardom undercutting their own numbers. So the chances are, if anything, and I, I doubt this, but if anything, they probably overinflated the five-star number and this is a more realistic number, if anything. But yeah, I'm the same. They looked very, very similar in terms of capacity. And just sort of piggybacking on what Armani said, this year, starting with Roncorican Hall 13 times, they have passed the 1,000-person mark seven of those 13 times. The first one was the Cinderella tournament in March, um, they drew 1,344. 1,390 the next time they ran Corican in April, but that was Utami and I believe Julia's leaving shows. Um, they didn't pass 1,000 again up until the Stardom Nighter in Corican, the, sec- um, the one in July, the second one. Um, and that was 1,017 people, which obviously this one outdrew. Five-star Grand Prix, the match, the show that you were talking about, 1,460 people. And then the last Stardom in Corican show, 1,022, which again, this one outdrew. So when you put it into context like that, and context is so key because statistics are great. I'm a huge numbers guy. I love numbers. I love stats because, and I cannot stress this enough, I'm a huge dork. But (laughs) I think you're going to say what I always say. The numbers don't lie. Again, you can like what you like, but but when it comes to the numbers, this company is clearly doing better than the other company because of the numbers, even though you might like something else. I thought that's where you're going to go, but Rob calls himself a dork. Uh, I will neither agree or disagree with that, but carry on, partner. (laughs) Um, Numbers and stats and data are great. However, you can manipulate data, numbers, and stats to make them fit your narrative make you fit their make you fit that story and i think that's where context is is very very important and i think when you take out the you know inverted commas special corican hall shows you know the tournament shows the farewell shows the retirement shows um drawing this number in corican is is a decent decent number um, and sort of puts into context because I know that we said um, actually on our preview show that we thought maybe they'd draw 1300 again um, with the addition of Tony Storm but obviously that wasn't quite the case but again still an impressive number when you consider that it's the third highest non-special Corican crowd since the COVID era which again 
absolutely tremendous stuff. Um, the results then are as follows. We open with a six-woman tag team match. The Cosmic Angels team of Natsupoi, Unimizumori, and Aya Sakura defeated the hate team of Konami, Rina, and Azusa in Nabo with Natsupoi pinning in Nabo with the Ferial Gift in 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Singles match, Hanako defeated Momokogo, who came out with a very new metal theme, which I'm a big fan of. Proper 90s power metal. It was great. Um, she defeated her with the Shirasagi in 5 Five minutes and 44 seconds in one of the most enjoyable matches on the card three-way 12 woman tag team match the god's eye team of tomoka inaba hina lady c and rani agami defeated the neo genesis team of starlight kid meisera miyu amasaki and suzu suzuki and the exv team of Mika wakasukiyama Zena, and rian with hina pinning miyu amasaki with the gato clutch in 15 minutes and nine seconds it was given a long time it was the second and third longest match on the card um six woman tag match followed this the cosmic angels team of Tam Nakano, Sayoriano, and Sayaka Karora defeating the hate team of Nadsukatora, Sayaka Matani, and Ruaka with Sayaka Karora pinning Sayaka Matani with the jackknife pin in 10 minutes and 42 seconds, which is wild saying out loud. But again, context is king. What a moment and what a reaction from the Corican crowd. Um, tag team match. The Stars team of Kogama and Sayurida defeated the Stars team of Hazuki and Hanan with Kogama pinning Hazuki with the diving body press in 18 minutes and 14 in what, in my humble opinion, was the best match on the card. Your semi-main event, the tag team match, Mina Shirakawa and a returning timeless Tony Storm, making her first appearance in stardom since the 7th of July 2019 and her first Corican Hall appearance since 16th of May in 2019, when she went to a time limit draw against Kagetsu, they defeated Mayu Iwatani and Azumi, Tony Storm pinning Azumi with the Storm Zero in 13 minutes and 23 seconds. And then in your main event, the Goddesses of Stardom Championship match, Hate, the champions, Momo Watanabe and Tekla, defeated the God's Eye team of Suri and Saki Kashima, Momo Watanabe pinning Saki Kashima with the Peach Sunrise in 16 minutes and 11 seconds to achieve their first successful title defense. Um, let's start at the very bit, very beginning, Matt, because as they say in The Sound of Music, it's a very good place to start. Um, what did you think about this opener? What is effectively the final showdown between Aya Sakura and Rina ahead of New Blood 15? Look at you with the sound of music reference, buddy. That was, as you know, what you never cease to impress me, buddy. You always impress me in the sound of music thing. Look at that, my friend. If you can put a jersey on that and ship it to the United <laughs> States, I would definitely buy this. Anywho, to answer your question, buddy, um, again, it started on putting on these, the first match of these shows, and then putting it free on YouTube. You have star power, you have with Natsupoy in there, and then you have your building towards your big main event for the very next day for New Blood with Rina and Aya Sakura, and they did a good job building that up. Azusa Naba, she was terrific here. Her stuff with Rina. And we mentioned this earlier in the show. We mentioned it last week. I'm going to mention again. Their stuff as a tag team is really, really good. I hope that's where we're going. Uh, one, because I would love to see both Anaba sisters in stardom full time. And I would love to see Azusa teaming with Arena because I think that's the perfect spot for them in, in current day stardom. Konami, she was terrific here. Wasn't doing too, too much of the heel stuff. Was just kick ass Konami. Again, not to play. She's great. Yuna Mizumori, again, one of the most. Uh, what she's been able to do, how she's been able to transform herself into a, just a great, great wrestler over the last two years. I'll never not be impressed with it. I mean, you can tell she's putting the work in because she's absolutely fantastic. But yeah, again, the main crux of this match is you're building Aya and Rina up for the next day. A solid, solid outing. I had this at the three and a half stars. Yeah, I think the focus was initially, at least rightly, on Rina and Aya Sakura ahead of them. Um, ahead of their title match. However, the exchanges between Natsupoi and Azusa in Narba are the highlight of the match, um, especially between, especially the transitions between the submission maneuvers. Um, I thought he was really good. I gave it three stars. What I found most interesting, though, was following Poi's victorious burial gift onto an old we cut to Tekla, who, as we know now, is the next challenger to Poi's white belt, applauding the victory. No attack, you know, no comforting her hate allies, applauding 
the victory. Now, I know she cut a backstage promo, and that's something I actually meant to mention earlier, that all of the backstage promos with English highlights will be, uh, English subtitles, sorry, will be making their way to Stardom World and have already started um, as of this Corrigan Hall show that we're talking about. So go and check them out on, uh, on Stardom World. But Tekla has actually said about how she wants to have a pure wrestling match, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, um, and about how they're going to see who's the best wrestler, her and Natsupoy. And I know there's been a lot of posting of uh, Tekla's reaction to Natsupoy turning on Donna Del Mondo. Um, what are your thoughts on this this rather this rather strange build-up to Nagoya Golden Fight? It's really interesting because, again, Natsupoy, she's an idol, Tekla, she's the idol killer. So you figured you can tell an easy and again, not to boy, as as white meat as baby face as you can go, and Tekla's as evil as you can get, right? And I mean that in the best way possible for both of them. So you figured you can tell this easy story, but Tekla's not attacking Natsupoy. She's not basically just applauding her. So it's like there's something else going on there. We know it's gonna be a great match. And again, we'll preview it at the end. I think it's going to be Tekla's best singles match ever because she has the opportunity to show. It's obviously going to be the biggest match of her career. And you know that Natsupoy is going to go out and put a fantastic match. Um, it's I don't know which way they're going. I, I don't, Again, I mean, I mentioned they could have gone a, a couple different ways. Is Tekla just being overly nice so Natsupoy drops her guard a little bit for Natsupoy or excuse me, for Tekla to take the advantage of a drop guard Natsupoy? That's a possibility. Again, is she trying to recruit her for hate? That's a possibility. Are they trying to recruit maybe other members of Cosmic Angels for hate? Because we see, and we'll get into it in a little bit, we see what Saka Karora is trying to pull the evil out of uh, Saya Kamatani. So, like, where is that story going? But it's really interesting with different members of Cosmic Angels and different members of hate of where they're going with certain things. I don't know where it's going. I'm intrigued. I cannot wait to see where it goes. Uh, regardless, this is going to be an excellent, excellent match. But yeah, it's a little weird that Tekla, who's attacked everybody from mm-hmm. anybody signing autographs to Mr. Okada to the referees to just about anybody um, that she can. But here it is, her biggest match against the person that turned on the faction two over two years ago. And she's like, no, we're good. It's all good. We're going to have a great, great back and forth technical wrestling match. I don't think it's I think that's the way the match is going to start to go. And then you're going to see Tekla ramping up the violence only for Natsupoy to turn into the murder pixie that she is to ramp it up even more. It's a really cool, interesting story that's going to be wrapped in a fantastic match. And dude, both Natsupoy and Tekla are doing a great job creating intrigue to build up to this championship match coming up this weekend, buddy. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, we move on to that singles match then. Hanako against Momokogo. And the most important thing here, Matt, is... Momokogo's new theme. Um, uh, metal. Metal metal Momokogo. MMK. Can we just turn her to Metal Momokogo? Is that where we're going with this? It, it sounded so power metal, like 90s power metal. <laughs> it was great. However, my one thing here is, does it suit Momokogo? Because in my opinion, it probably suited Hanako more than it <laughs> suits Momokogo. Do you think the sound guy? You think the sound guy got the wrong? Thing? I imagine. Do you think that's what happened? <laughs> you know how many indie shows I've been on where it was like, holy! I remember one indie show where I think like the first six people came out to Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne. I'm like, how can you not just sit next track? <laughs> like, how are you? Oh, this is back. Amazing. This, this is like 15, 16 years ago where every, you had to submit your CD as soon as you came in. You'd have to write like Matt Turner track three or whatever. But it was like five out of the first six people who came out to a Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne. Maybe that's what happened here. I don't know. I love Momo Kogo. I love me some metal. So um, if if that's the way they're going with metal Momo Kogo, and that's maybe what we're going to refer to as, I'm all for it. But yeah, you might be right. That might have... Hanako's your new big bad uh, kick ass wrestler that you're pushing. So you're right, that metal theme did suit her, but regardless, if we're going metal Momo Kogo, I'm all in, buddy. And I'm all horns in, my man, as uh, as I'm doing the Ronnie James Dio, nobody can see it. I'm doing the Ronnie De- James Dio devil horns. Yeah, if she comes out at Corrigan tomorrow wearing a Slayer shirt, we know that uh, it was <laughs> definitely for her. We transitioned to, uh, to prop. We've had emo Starlight Kid 
emo Sai Gamatani, and now we've got thrash metal Momo. <laughs> Um, Rob, do you do you remember uh, uh, Wrestle Kingdom Eight, where Marty Freeman, formerly of Megadeth, played Hiroshi Tanahashi out to the ring I for do. his match with Nakamura? Can you imagine that if at uh, at one of these Wrestle Kingdom shows or the uh, the show at Sumo Hall that a uh, Kerry King from Slayer plays out Momo Coco? Oh, it'd be incredible! It would be <laughs> incredible. Um, wearing a baseball jersey. Wearing a baseball jersey. <laughs> oh. Imagine Nats- Natsumi Shozuki, by the way. Um, just FYI, uh, that's the best. Um, but yeah, this was this was great. There was um, an attempt of Momokogo to focus on Hanako's arm to negate her overwhelming power advantage. Um, she also used the tag of faint kick in a rather unique way that I've never seen her use to specifically target the arm. Unfortunately for her, um, it's the power that proves pivotal for Hanako, and she flattens Momo with the JP coaster before proceeding to deadlift her into the Shirasagi, which we saw her do with Rani Agami um, last week, and it is very impressive. Um, I know that she's not going to be able to do it to every single opponent, but when she can, it does look like an absolutely killer move. Um we're given a tremendous amount of time, five minutes and forty-four seconds. But again, another definitive win for uh, for Hanukkah. Yeah, again, they had less than six minutes to tell their story, but they did a great, great job. Momo, these two wrestlers, they maximized every second that they had in the ring. Um, it's really, really solid outing between these two. I love to see these two run it back. Maybe nine, ten, eleven minutes. Again, I understand you want to give those last three matches the bulk of the time for obvious reasons. But regardless, what they had within less than six minutes, I thoroughly enjoyed it. These two wrestlers were terrific. Obviously, Hanako, what they're doing with her and her build up is really interesting and it works. And we're obviously huge fans of Momo Kogo. Three and a half stars for me, brother. Um, moving on then, um, again to one of my favorite matches on the card, the twelve the three way twelve woman. Matt Maysera is a treasure that needs to be protected at all costs. And that's not only because she's a phenomenal wrestler and had an excellent opening sequence with Xena, but also because she is so effortlessly funny in everything she does. The Like, for example, really struggling to get her leg to a height that she can partake in the pose with the rest of Neo Genesis. She she's just an absolute delight. And in the same way as Saki Kashima, she seems to be funny without slapstick humor. And that I really appreciate. Plus, she's a phenomenal wrestler as well. Um, but that aside, um, this was fantastic. This was so good. And for me, the main crux of this match was Starlight Kid and Micah. Um, just a really, really, really good exchange. Two people we haven't seen wrestle in a singles capacity all too often. And it all starts with a tremendous move where Starlight Kid hits the standing moonsault to Rani Yagami and goes for the pin. And Micah, we've seen her deadlift people out of pins before, but here, not only should she deadlift Starlight Kid out of the pin, she then, in one smooth motion also dumped her over the top rope to the outside. And I was like, I love that. I want to see Micah do that more often. Just literally pick people out of pins and toss them out of the ring. Brilliant, Matt. Yeah, going back on the, the first thing you said about this match with uh, May Sarah's uh, comedic timing without her even trying to be funny. Brother, in Philadelphia, we had a front row ticket to uh, her her comedy, considering the fact that Mariah May not only cut the line in the autograph session, she cut you. Correct me if I'm wrong. I she think did. It, I think... I think she she cut the line and then went to go uh, meet her idol Mina Shirakawa, her and then her idol. and May Sarah had a re- meet her and her and May Sarah had a really really funny back and forth, and we were literally just a few feet away, and uh, we, we were we were laughing, had a really good time with it. But uh, yeah, a lot of the um, the Starlight Kid versus Micah stuff. Again, what are we doing with Micah coming off this? What she did in the Five Star Grand Prix, only to come just so close to getting that World of Stardom Championship back. If we're going with her in a Starlight Kid program after Starlight Kid with does her stuff with Hazuki, I'm all for. We do to, we do need to make mention because I, you know, obviously we're talking about Starlight Kid and Micah, the little um, mishap that happened in this match that was actually pretty scary. It was, yeah. With Starlight Kid, Starlight Kid coming off the top rope, looked like she was going for a high cross body, and Micah just wasn't ready to catch her. And I didn't know if that was maybe the planned spot 
or if Starlight Kid didn't see her. I don't know what happened. And again, me and Andy Hedder were texting back and forth watching this. And myself and Andy, uh, again, obviously we've been a tag team for the better part of five years. But we've been in matches where somebody's not expecting something or something was off key. And somebody like goes down and then you're worried because the last thing you want, it's one thing to have a bad match. It happens all the time. The last thing you want is for somebody to get hurt. And we're kind of texting back and forth again, which just you know, meet him kind of peeling back the curtain here. Just kind of the stuff that was going on in the ring kind of halted. We're all just watching Micah, mm. making sure she's okay because she was grabbing her neck. And I saw she rolled to the outside and she was being attended to. And I think it was Daichi was the referee, did a great job making sure it was okay. We were kind of texting back and forth and we both kind of agreed maybe she just needed a minute. She comes back in the ring and then has that great sequence that she does with Starlight Kid, then goes back out, gets worked on a little bit, and then comes back and finishes the match. Uh, as far as we can tell, you know, that that the show happened about uh, a few days ago. We haven't heard anything. She's on, obviously, she's on the, the pay-per-view coming up this weekend. She's on the Cork and Hall show in a really, really big match, which we'll, we'll talk about later on. So she, she is okay. Now, she did make mention on social media a day or two after the match that somebody asked her how her neck was. And she said that uh, she heard it, and then she went out, got drunk, and woke up the next day and felt fine. So uh, apparently, beer is her elixir, and she's fine. That's the main thing thing i'm glad that she was okay again just kind of going back and watching it look look like that it was just something that was missed time which it happens folks it's pro wrestling nobody's at fault but it looks like that she's she's okay and she might have just need a minute to kind of get her bearings back and i've been there before andy's been there before so it seems like she's okay and that's the most important thing but yeah this match uh, once it got ramped back up was a load of fun where you have 12 great wrestlers three really really good teams and I was just shocked that it was Neo Genesis, who, again, as we call the shiny, cool new thing over in Star, that not only did they not win, but it was Hina getting the pin over Miyu Amazaki. So, again, and, and Hina's been able to show a lot of great high speed style wrestling these last shows. I think me and you were texting back and forth. I think it was earlier this week or last week saying, you know, she's really showcasing some high speed style wrestling. My guess with the win here in Cork and Hall, um, considering the fact that she got a win over a stable mate that is May Sarah a high-speed champion, and we need more high-speed wrestlers, you know, for Mace to defend that championship against, I would not be shocked if somewhere between now and the end of the year we see a big high-speed championship match between Hina and uh, Mace which I'm all for because I think that would be great. Regardless, this was a terrific match. You got a lot of great stuff with Waka, with Micah, Mina, obviously Tomoka Inaba, she's fantastic. Her stuff, uh, her and Ronnie Igami basically playing, like, who's the hardest hitter between these uh, – between the two on the same team, she fits in so well with this God's eye mold. And I know I said it about five minutes ago that, that I hope Azusa Naba is signed full time uh, to start him so she can start team with Rena. Same thing with Tomoka Inaba. God's eye needs that really, really big second to Sherry being the big main eventer and the leader of God's eye. Tomoka Inaba fits that role perfectly, not only in stardom, but within God's eye. But absolutely right, my friend. Terrific match that did see a uh, kind of a shock finish which I have no problem with them elevating younger talent, which we'll get into uh, in a little bit on, on the next match. Three and three-fourth stars for me, my friend. Yeah, I gave it three and a half. And it was it was a question, actually, I wanted to bring up to you, you know, having been in the ring. Um, and it's sort of what at what point do you take a wrestler's word out of the equation? Because obviously it was a very scary moment for Micah. Um, and as you mentioned, it looks like it was her neck. And for a good 30 seconds, she wasn't moving. Now, at what point do you, because as a wrestler, and again, this is going off what I've heard, because obviously I have no experience of this, you do. A wrestler will want to carry on. A wrestler will want to finish the match. You know, We've seen wrestlers wrestle with torn ACLs and, and all sorts. You know, we had just, what, in July, we found out that Ami Sori had done something to her ACL and had been wrestling on top of it before she tore a meniscus as well. So at what point does the referee sort of take out the fact that Micah is saying, you know, just as an example, Micah, it turns out, may well have been absolutely fine. It was just shock or whatever. But at what point does the referee go, no, you're not fine. I'm stopping this match. Like, because you can't necessarily take a wrestler's word for it, especially with, you know, stuff that we know now regarding concussions and things like that. At what point would you, would you take it out of the wrestler's hands? 
That's a great question. I mean, you have to be, you know, if you have a concussion, you might be able to see the days look in their eyes. Or a lot of times you do the, you do the gimmick where they grab your hand and they may say, Hey, you know, what's your name? Where are you at? Uh, my all time favorite ref to work with. And I've worked with a lot of really great refs, a lot of refs that are on AWTV. My favorite ref to uh, work with is my buddy ref, Matt, because what he will do if I take the dumb bump, which I've taken a lot of these crazy bumps before, and I probably still will. Um, a lot of times he'll squeeze my hand and make sure I'm okay. And then he will mention a Simpsons reference just to make sure that I get the, what's the next line is in the Simpsons reference. That's how he knows that I'm okay because he's got a personal and professional relationship with me. We have somebody like Daichi, again, in my opinion, the best referee in all of wrestling, who's been in a lot of big time matches and knows a lot of these wrestlers. Um, you know, when it comes to concussion maybe that's when he can see because is this person days this person okay it seemed like with micah he checked out micah micah might have just said hey i just need a minute and this is the perfect match to need a minute because there's 11 other wrestlers that can kind of cover for you yeah. at this point and considering the fact you have all the seconds out there to make sure they're okay obviously micah had a big role in that part of the match where they kind of had to slow things down and tried okay micah was in spots four and five here we need to take her out how do we call the audible they were able to be you know take a second and figure out where they need to go and then get to spots eight, nine, and 10. Um, it did seem like she was able to move her arms and her, and her legs. She went to the outside and then came back in when it was time for her to come back in for her spots. So a lot of it is kind of, you really don't know because the wrestlers and a lot of the wrestlers that have pride will be like, no, I want to continue. And I've been in that spot before where I've had my bell rung or the worst injury I've ever had and knock on wood of doing this over 20 years is when I really, really jazzed up my foot two years ago in that tag tournament in the very first round where I was like, no, I can continue the tag tournament. And I was icing my foot as we were calling spots for the next match. And so the referee was like, that thing is purple and three times the size of your other foot, you're not going out there. So, and and I would have continued to wrestle on said ankle and said foot, but the doctor was like, and the promoter was like, no, man, I'm putting a stop to this because you're going to make this worse. So that is in one instance in my personal uh, experience where it was like, no, I, I'm fine. I can continue that's not a problem. Let's call the spots for the next match where the promoter, the booker, and the doctor, better part of judgment, was like, no. And that ultimately probably was the right call because I was going to wrestle two more matches on a foot that I couldn't even walk on. So um, a lot of times you you have the adrenaline, you have pride, you have your passion, and your love for pro wrestling where the wrestler is going to want to continue where sometimes uh, you know somebody a little smarter like a doctor – our referee needs to step in and say, no, 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 you're not okay. Um, we're going to, you know, call the match. Or we're going to end the match or we're going to call an audible where it looked like Micah was just like, give me a minute. Let me shake it off. Was able to come back and finish the match and then finish the match. Well, and then told everybody, yeah, I just needed a minute to shake it off and then uh, fuel myself with some alcohol, which is another reason why we absolutely love Micah. <laughs> so I'm just really glad that it wasn't something seriously injured because when you have an athlete with the intensity and just the uh, how great Starlight Kid is coming off the ropes, and you're not there. You know, you could hit the neck. It's just, uh, it could have been something really, really bad, and I'm glad that Mike is okay, and I'm glad that uh, everything was good to go, and I'm glad they finished this match, which ultimately, again, was one of the better matches on which was a fantastic show. Moving on then to Cosmic Angels and Hate, and if you look at the two teams, you would be forgiven, Matt, for thinking there is one outlier in terms of taking the pinfall. Now, however, you, as I was, would be sorely mistaken, and it's also a mistake that Sayaka Matani makes, because she completely dismisses Sayaka Karora as a threat throughout this match. And I referenced, I believe, Victoria Yuzuki on the Marigold Standard as the... um, the Marigold version of Whack-A-Mole, where she just wouldn't stay down. And I think Sayaka Karora had a little bit of that today. Um, Well, on this show, anyway, where she just repeatedly kept going at Sayaka Matani in spite of Sayaka Matani's clear annoyance and clear just, I don't want to deal with you. I've got a feud with Sayoriano and I'm gunning for Tam's red belt. Will you leave me alone? And ultimately gets the victory. It's like, where the hell did that come from? And you're looking at it, and considering Saya has eaten very few pins since she turned heel, you're thinking, oh, how are the crowd going to react to her being beaten by a rookie? And actually, 
the crowd responds massively. There's like this collective gasp before they erupt into a chant of Karora, and it's a thoroughly heartwarming moment. It's a huge moment for Sayaka, isn't it? Yeah, considering the fact that we knew going in this match, you're just building Soriano and uh, Sai Kamatani, that eventually you're probably going to get to Sai Kamatani and Tam. Again, we're probably thinking it's probably going to happen in Sumo Hall. Regardless, whenever they do it, I'm all for it because it's going to be a great match because those two have great chemistry. And you're building towards the crux of the match, and we're getting the Anu versus Sai Kamatani. And don't get me wrong, Natsuka Tora and Ruwaka, they were great in their roles here as well. But the bigger story was building to this big singles match we're going to have somewhere down the road. And then you get your beta breaks down to almost an, a singles match with Sayaka Karora and Sayaka Matani. We've seen this basically in the psychology and the way that Stardom builds up their tag matches, especially their multi uh, person tag matches. But like, okay, now here's basically the one on one. Tam's going to come in, Anu's going to come in from time to time. Tor and Ruwaka, they're going to eventually going to take them out hold them down long enough where Kamatani is going to be able to put the young Sayaka Karora away. But Sayaka Karora keeps coming back. Like you said, like the whack-a-mole, you're absolutely right, partner. Keeps coming back and he's getting these near falls. And the crowd is absolutely molten hot because they're biting on all these near falls. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is a great job that Kamatani is doing, making Sayaka Karora, who's a really good wrestler and is gaining a lot of momentum these last few months, making her look better than she already does and maybe making her looking the best that she ever has. And then my head, I'm like, ultimately, it's going to be like the, one of the, the violent kicks that Kamatani does and probably the Star Crusher that's going to put uh, Karora away. But boy, what a great way to build up Saka Karora. And then instead of, they just don't have their chips in. They go all in because it was just like, you build, you build, you build. Yeah, the heel's going to get the win here, right? No, the big baby face gets the three count. And this place goes absolutely crazy. Rob Gooden, we have a new star that is born. And, uh, and considering the fact that this is a loaded roster, and that Sayaka Kora is in a very loaded group with Cosmic Angels, considering the fact that Aya Sakura the next day is getting a shot at the future star champion. The fact that Yuna Mizumori is coming off this really good run in the five-star Grand Prix, considering the fact that Soriano is absolutely fantastic. Considering the fact that you have Tam, the Red Belt champion, and Natsupoi, the White Belt champion, in this faction, you literally took a star and was just like, yeah, let's have her pin Sai Kamatai and let's see where it goes. You have a new star in this company and a wrestler that's really, really good, and that's only going to get better. Fantastic match. The pop was absolutely huge. I had it three and a half stars. But as you know, partner, I always give extra credit when you get the crowd that much involved. I bumped it up to three and three-fourth stars. And what was really cool about this, not only do we have a new star born in Sayaka Karora, but we're getting the rematch with Sakura and Sai Kamatani that's really intriguing now coming up this Saturday on an absolutely loaded card but Sakura Karora was basically begging Sai Kamatani to like come off the dark side so now you can look at this as like is Sakura Karora going to be the one to pull Kamatani out of the dark side or maybe Sai Kamatani is going to convince Sakura Karora to join hey there's two different ways to look at it but maybe you're at a point, and we've seen Sai Kamatani at her absolute best during those big matches and the five-star Grand Prix where she's cool Phoenix queen, but she's still wrestling like the Golden Phoenix. Because when she's wrestling as 100% heel, it's good, but it's like, eh, we know what Sai Kamatani can be. But we saw those matches with Han and Suzu Suzuki, the final with Micah, that match with Starlight Kid at the quarterfinals, where she's molding this really, really cool heel into her fantastic moveset as the Golden Phoenix. So is it, and I think that's eventually where in six, eight, eight to 12 months from now, that's where we're going to go with Sai Kamatani because there's so much money in that. We hear all the time that Sai Kamatani shirts are selling out pretty much at each and every show that they're doing um, at these venues. So do we get the point where we mold these two things together? The really cool character that is the Phoenix Queen and the phenomenal another level wrestler that is the Golden Phoenix. And is it Sayaka Karora, the one that's going to be able to pull this out? making her even more interesting. I don't know, buddy. There's so much cool stuff going on here, and I can't wait to see what they do. And, I, and, and I, you know, I'm not going to talk about it. Now, we'll get into it when we get into the, uh, the preview of, uh, of this big pay-per-view on Saturday. But regardless, great match and ending. I had no idea I saw it was coming. It was a fantastic match with a great finish with a story that I don't know where they're going, but I'm really, really intrigued. I cannot stress to you, Matt, and I mean this, how little... I want to see Sayaka Karora as a member of hate. Like, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that's a possibility. You're not allowed, you're not allowed to say. I, 
at this, okay, then here's what I'm going to say, buddy. Here's here's my prediction. That's just going to make you feel so much better than Sakura going to hate. Is that Sayaka Kuro is going to pull the queen out of Sayaka Matani and Sayaka Kuro and uh, Sayaka Matani and Momo Watanabe are going to reform Queen's Quest. There you go. Is that is that better? Is that better? That's wild, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a wild man, buddy. You just said I'm off my rock. I'm a wild that's man. True. That is true. Wearing baseball jer- well, you know why I said that? Because I have a Queen's Quest baseball jersey in, in America. True. And, and, and which is true. That is 100% true. I have a Queen's Quest baseball jersey in my closet, which in that closet is in my house that is in Pennsylvania, that is in the United States of America, my friend. So there you go. There you go. I wonder how many times we can actually get this reference in. Um, <laughs> I feel like we're doing it on the Robin podcast. I feel like we probably need to do this on the Marigold stand. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe we just hit our limit for this podcast and we'll save it when we record uh, in a few days for Marigold. <laughs> <laughs> You've got that to look forward to, guys. Um, <laughs> now, Obviously, this tag match, the All-Stars tag match, I imagine, Matt, if wrestling did interventions, that this is exactly what this match would be. Because though Hazuki is certainly in a better place than she was immediately following Namba Grand Fight, she's still not herself. She's doing the pose, the hood is down, but the fire is still very much out in her eyes. Stars, however, are determined to build her back up and draw out some of that infamous Hazuki violence. Um, Even Hannon, her own tag team partner, joins in on showing that tough love. Um, But overall, Matt, the Corican crowd, that swelling, that huge groundswell of support for her, eventually, alongside, you know, Sayurida, Kogama, and Hannon beating her up, begins to light that fire it begins to reignite it and this culminates in an absolutely fantastic closing stretch between Kogama and Hazuki the two best friends throwing absolutely everything at each other with Sayurida and Hanan sort of playing bit parts as desperate partners trying to break up pinfalls um but overall this is an incredibly emotional match. Um, I think it's done perfectly. I've actually been a really big fan of the way they've booked this storyline. Um, and most importantly to come from this, Hazuki is back, people. She is back. And first on the list is Starlight Kid and Nagoya Golden Fight. This is going to be awesome, my friend. Now. Nah. Not only was this match great, but what you did, correct me if I'm wrong, partner, because I think this is exactly, this is what I think. What you did is, when's the last team, a tag team like FWC, right now, FWC now, has been this interesting? Like, don't get me wrong, you have a phenomenal tag division. And there's been some interesting tag teams, like Crazy Star, FWC, Kid, and Momo Watanabe a couple years ago. But as far as a storyline driven... Has there ever been a tag team in the last two, three years that has been this interesting, what they're currently doing? doing with fwc yes aphrodite tag team oh before yeah. that cage you? match yeah oh you do have a point but anyway you see where i'm I going see is where like, you're going yeah absolutely yeah, good, good point. i'm never gonna say no to you tommy and sayakamatani queen's quest forever baseball jersey uh by the way anyway <laughs> um so now what you did is what you, and how you really like you see like the we've seen it a little bit in these tag matches We've seen a little bit of the fire, and then it gets cooled down. It's like you're throwing ice on the fire. A little bit of the fire, and it gets cooled down. And then we're getting up. We got really, really close to, you know, Hazuki mode. And then how does Koguma bring out full Hazuki mode? Koguma goes full Hazuki mode on Hazuki. And I'm like, this is where she turns. This is where she turns. And then we get back to Hazuki mode. And yeah, absolutely right. Ida, phenomenal. Hanan, they were great. But eventually what happened was they play the roles perfectly. Then they kind of split apart and let these two best friends, these two great tag team wrestlers, tag team partners, go and settle their differences kind of in the middle of the ring. Koguma gets the win here. Hazuki is back. It looks like FWC is a well-oiled machine. And Rob Goodwin, here's the genius booking, at least for me, from where I'm sitting. In my opinion, FWC is back. They're going to be probably better than ever just in time for the goddess of stardom tag team tournament now i'm gonna ask you this question because i actually don't know this answer 
has a tag team ever won the Goddess of Stardom tag team tournament twice? I know Thunder Rock, they won it one year, and then they went to the finals and lost to Yoko Bito and Kairi when EO turned on Mayu. But has a tag team ever won the tournament twice? Hmm. I don't now, think so, no. I know a wrestler has won it twice. But oh, sure. Yeah. As an actual sure. team. Um, I was trying to think back. I know that BY How won it in 2012, didn't they? Um, if I had my copy of Living the Dream, <laughs> and I'm not even joking because on Ra- that book, for those of you who have, first of all, if you have not got it, what are you doing? That book is Rob literally literally talks about every single start of match from 2011, but the first handful of pages, Rob gives you all of the tournament winners from the start of every tournament, the Cinderella, the five star uh, and the goddess uh, from them until 2021. But if I literally had it in front of me, I would be able to tell that. And I've read that book so many times because it's phenomenal. And again, I can't put that over and you over enough, brother, and kudos, but I don't think a tag team has won that tournament twice. I don't, I think this you're kind right. of puts that- this kind of puts FWC in that mark where it's just like, maybe they win this tournament again, because they're the most interesting story. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, not only they're the best tag team in stardom, they're the best tag team in all of wrestling. What's to say they win that tournament. And then they go to sumo hall where it's FWC versus Momo Watanabe and Tekla, as we're continuing to build Momo and Tekla up as heel tag team champions. That's going to be a really, really great match. If that's the way they go, but uh, regardless, my man, yeah, excellent, excellent match. I had this at four and a quarter stars. This was really terrific and a great, great story. And then I think everybody sang happy birthday to Hazuki after this match as well. Yeah, it was Hazuki's birthday. Um, all of the stuff after the pinfall. Like, the win is completely immaterial because the moment the bell sounds, Fukuoka Double Crazy are embracing on the floor. They're joined by Saya and Hanan. There's some incredibly emotional speeches from both Saya and Kagama. Saya just breaks down and hugs Hazuki. Um, and Hazuki takes to the microphone. And then she completely breaks down. Um, and then obviously, yeah, leads the crowd in a uh, in a chant of happy birthday to herself because it was her birthday. It's also uh, Hazuki's birthday as we record today. So happy birthday to Azumi, who we're going to be talking about right now because the semi-main event, Tony Storm and Mina Shirakawa versus Mayu and Azumi. Now, I do love the fact that we got the monochrome filter for Tony's entrance, as we did for the press conference, which again we're gonna uh, we're gonna preface the uh, the preview with. Um, my only concern, and I, I said this going into the whole Tony Storm program, was whether Tony's timeless gimmick would translate well to Japan. Well, it transpires that the Corican crowd are very receptive to it, and they cheer whenever Tony strikes a pose or labels Mayu a bitch, apparently. Apparently, they absolutely love that. Um, To me, at least, it appears that Tony is still more than capable of wrestling at this pace, and she proves that in the opening sequence with Mayu, and then when all four women then opt to begin throwing themselves around the ring with uh, with released German suplexes. But we've seen it before with the difference in styles between American and Japanese wrestling that a wrestler might have to slow down somewhat because it is a more entertainment-focused product in America. And of course, the timeless gimmick in itself is more entertainment. And the most notable case of a wrestler having to slow down to you know wrestle the American style is EO Sky. Um and it's this in-ring Tony that we haven't seen for a long time. Don't get me wrong, I think there is more that we're going to see. And I think in a singles match with the best in the world in Mayu Iwatani, I think we are going to see even more in Nagoya. But this is a very good preview. Um, it was all about reintroducing the audience to Tony and her new gimmick. And it has to be said that in that regard, I'd argue, Matt, that this match is a rip-roaring success. Yeah, this was great. Uh, this is my favorite match of the show. I wish it went a little bit more, more than 13 minutes, but again, maybe I'm just being greedy because you have Tony Storm, who's fantastic, Mina Shirakawa, Worldwide Mina, and two of my favorite wrestlers in current day wrestling and Mayu Iwatani and Azumi uh, in this match. Yeah, I thought this was great. And again, and I, I had this conversation texting with Andy back and forth, considering the fact that Tony is in Japan and she's in she's in, going to be in Japan for the better part of it was like seven or eight days. Right. So like, what is she doing in Japan? Like she has this match. 
obviously the press conference, which we'll get into. And then she's got a match coming up again uh, on the 2nd of October. Again, we're, we're recording this on the 1st of October. What else do you think she's doing? I don't think she's just doing sightseeing. I think that she's going to be spending time in the stardom dojo, kind of getting back to that style. Again, she doesn't need to wrestle the stardom style 100% all the time in every match that she's doing in AEW because it's a different style. And it's, she's able to develop the timeless character, which is amazing, into that style. But again, she's in this match. She's not in it long before you're like, oh, okay. Okay. Not only is she melding the timeless Tony Storm character with the, you know, the rocker Tony Storm wrestler that that was former World of Stardom champion, but she's able to do it all so well. And she was able to keep up with the Zumi and Mayu at every single part of this match, where I think was ter- absolutely terrific. And again, uh, knowing how much Tony Storm has, and we said this last week, and I'll say it again, how much Tony Storm absolutely loves Japan and the respect that she has for stardom. I have a feeling that she's spending a handful of hours in the week or so or a week and a half that she's over there training in the storm dojo to make sure this match that she has with mayu coming up on saturday is one that we will not not forget and uh, i'm willing to bet a decent amount of money that it's going to be an absolutely blow away match she was in the the majority of the match um i mean she really kept you know took the heat and was able to give a lot of stuff back it was a really cool spot where she's really starting to ramp up her offense with the hip attacks and then mayu hits us with a super kick and then tony storm sells it to the outside mayu hits the pitcher, pitcher perfect dive and folks, if you don't think Tony Storm is all in in this match with Mayu Otani, she takes a double foot stomp, four feet, double foot stomp from Mayu and Izumi in the middle of the ring that I thought that was going to plant Tony Storm in that middle of Cork and Hall like a flag because, oh boy, howdy, Mayu and Izumi came down at the same time onto poor Tony Storm. Absolutely fantastic stuff there. Tony and Mina's stuff was really, really good. I liked how uh, the black and white camera, like Tony, when she came out, was all black and white, like in the t- timeless gimmick. And then, you know, you have Mina, who's the most colorful wrestler, like in all of wrestling. I thought that was really cool, interesting stuff. Mina was great here as, as well. The ending sequence with Izumi and Tony Storm, that was really good. We saw them have like a six or seven minute match on Collision a handful of months ago. That was really, really good. And actually, Gardner, I think the highest rating for that collision was that match. I think it had the highest quarter hour outer rating, hour rating of that episode of collision. And these two kind of, you know, mimic that great match they had over here on American soil. And the final few minutes with Tony storm, getting the win over Zumi, which was the right call. We know Zumi is in line for a future shot at the IWGP championship. There's a possibility that she may win it and rightfully so, but for the match going into Nagoya this weekend, the right call was for Tony storm to get a win. Cause she has not had, you know, she hasn't wrestled in Japan in the last four or five years, as you mentioned before partner. So her getting a big win in Cork and hall over a superstar. That's like a Zumi to really build up this match was the right call four and a quarter stars for me, my friend, fantastic match and everybody was over Azumi, Mayu, Tony, Mina everybody was over, the crowd was really really into this match which for me elevated that match even more yeah they were a great crowd as the Corrigan Hall crowds often are but when you get them on side and you get that response they are like a it really does reinvent a match um, and though you know it, they've been louder obviously but I think they were really into this match and they were into you know these last four matches because they were really into that Cosmic Angels and Hate match as well um, speaking of Hate the Goddess of Stardom Championship match Momo Watanabe and Tekla defeating Suri and Saki Kashima it was a bit of an inevitability that this was going to happen Matt, that Hate were going to retain and I think the way it played Played out was, which is bizarre for a for a hate match. I think it was quite safe, and what I mean by that is, it played out exactly as we thought it would. Isolating Saki Kashima and getting the pinfall over Saki. There were some really good exchanges, mainly between Suri and Momo. Those kicks to the chest. You know, I'm never ever ever going to turn down that. Um, there was a really good exchange at the start with Tekla and Suri, even though at the start when Tekla drops to her back, I immediately had the SpongeBob SquarePants theme in my head that says drop on the deck and flop like a fish. Um, That is immediately what I saw when she dropped to her back. But I still feel like there was another gear to this match. It was a good match. And I think Saki got the crowd on side with her underdog performance. I think it was a really, really good performance. And Hate were clinical in the way that they isolated her and they were able to keep Suri out of the majority of this match. But I feel like there was another gear to have. What do you think? 
Yeah, I totally agree. I had it at four stars. I figured this kind of this could have been four and a quarter to four and a half, yeah. considering the talent that is there. Again, it was good, but it's like it just seemed like it was missing something. Uh, and I, I don't know, maybe a longer stretch out finish, maybe more Sherry versus Momo wants a knobby violence. I don't know. Ultimately, what this does is not only is it give Momo and uh, Tekla their first V win, uh, you know, the first successful defense of the Goddess Belts in Cork and Hall against a team that has Shuri on there, you know, one of the best wrestlers in stardom's history, still very much in her prime. But Tekla looked really, really good here, especially onto Sherry. So you did a good job building Tekla up into this match, considering in one week's time, uh, she's wrestling for well, one week of the show. She's wrestling not Sapoy uh, for the Wonder of Stardom Championship. So you did a good job with that. Tekla did a great job able to take uh, Sherry out of the match just enough for Momo Watanabe to isolate Saki Kashima and to get the win there. You know, they did a good job teasing the Kishi Kasai, which the crowd did bite on. But ultimately, it was Momo Watanabe able to put her violence to use here and hit the Peach Sunrise for the three count. Again, a really, really good match. It was just missing just something. Maybe this is something that they run back. I know I had a decent amount of people the next day or two days afterwards saying the same thing, like this was missing something. But maybe it's building towards a rematch. There's a lot of people that want to see this match run back sometime in the next four or five months only for Shuri Nasaki Kashima to be able to overcome the hate duo and win the goddess of stardom championship belts. If that's the way they're going, then this match went about the right way. They gave you just a little bit to wet the beak and enough. That's going to make you want to come back again, four stars for me, a solid outing to what was ultimately another really, really good show from stardom. I think as well, something that we have to point out is that Saki, pardon me, Saki Kashima is now out injured. Um, there is a chance that she's wrestling with an injury during this match. So, you know, that might have something to do with it. But nevertheless, I thought her performance was absolutely fantastic. Um, I thought, you know, as an underdog baby face, you know, someone who's transitioned from a sniveling heel in a Waratai to becoming this lovable baby face, um, still a coward, obviously. But I think that's what makes her character so good is that she's a coward except against hate. You know, there she's promised that she's going to fight and stand by Siri's side, and it's made her so ridiculously endearing to the crowd. Um, I th- yeah, I, there was there was just something. There was a spark that was missing. It was a good match, but it was nothing more. And uh, again, I feel like a big positive to take from it. Completely echoing your sentiments, is Tekla looked very good in the match and reminding everyone that she's not just a brawler. She is a very good wrestler. And that of course is the aim of her match with Natsupoy. She wants to have a good wrestling match with Natsupoy, whether that's all words and hate getting to, you know, hate getting involved almost immediately. I don't know, but that's by the by. Um, overall, a really good show. We moved into the 29th of September with the new blood 15 show this was aired live on youtube and is still there now if you want to go and check this out from takurazawa sakura town hall a in saitama 326 people listed as attending this show now that puts it as the 10th um highest attendance in the new blood chronology there have been 17 overall it's also the exact same number listed for new blood 14 at 326 it is also the smallest number that stardom have ever drawn at the takora zawa sakura town hall a now i say ever like it's a huge thing they've only run the venue i believe four times so it's not a huge loss, the fact that they've only, you know, but they've drawn 458, 505, 404, and then this 326. And they've only been running it for two years, 2023 and 2024. But that's what I mean, Matt, when I said earlier about you can make stats say what you want. If you left it at the headline, stardom draw lowest attendance at Sakura Zawa, Sakura Town Hall ever, that's going to sound a lot more, you know, ominous than it was a new blood show. They've only run the venue four times and they've only been running it since 2023. It it immediately becomes a little bit more uh, a little bit more palatable, especially when you consider that you didn't have any of your biggest stars on that show. Um that- close the close the close the doors is what Rap's saying. Sell the promotion. It's absolutely done. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there's no there's no need now. Stardom cast's <laughs> over. We're done. Okay. Um give us baseball jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> um the card and results are as follows. Tomoka 
Inaba defeated Rian with the crossface in 9 minutes and 4 seconds. Sayaka Karora defeated Evolution Joshi Pro Wrestling's Soy in 7 minutes and 26 seconds with the Tokameki Cutter. Um, God's Eye, Lady C and Rani Agami defeated Azusa Inaba and Ruaka with Lady C pinning Azusa Inaba with the reverse Oklahoma Stampede in 10 minutes and 9 seconds. Hanako defeated PPP Tokyo's Achika Miyabi in 8 minutes and 33 seconds with the Shirasagi. Um, Mio Amasaki defeated Hina with the Tenzai in 10 minutes and 25 seconds, which it turns out is uh, is now an impromptu number one contendership match for the Future of Stardom Championship, as we know. And then Future of Stardom title match, Rina gets an astonishing 12th successful title defense in this 500 plus day reign with the future of stardom title submitting Ayasukura with the hydrangea in 14 minutes and 37 seconds um matt this was a really quick card the entire show was only i think an hour and 50 minutes and there was a like a 10 minute break in the middle of it so really easy show to watch i would argue that there's not a great deal of and I don't want this to sound horrible, not a great deal of substance in this show. There was some really eye-catching performances, and we're going to go into that in a moment, but in terms of shows that you only really need to see the last two, I would say this qualifies. Yeah, I mean, every, uh, the, every, the matches were really good, but considering the fact of how spoiled we've been great with Stardom and Marigold, you know, over these past handful of months, this was just, you know, it was a good show, but considering the fact that every show has been great, um, yeah, it was kind of a two match show. I do like how Tomoka Inaba is now using a submission finisher. Like, mm-hmm. usually we see her with the Inaba drop, the Mijinoka driver, and that penalty kick, the one shot, one kill, Tomoka kill, one kill. You know, like the light keeps going longer and longer. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I like the fact that she's using a cross face. I mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago how great she is with her grappling. It's very underrated because of how great her striking is. And she gets a win here with a cross face, which I thought was really, really good. But uh, yeah, partner, I mean, it was, it was a fun show. It was a quick show. It was a new blood show. You know, you didn't have Kamatani on there. You didn't have Tam. You didn't have Micah. But regardless, yeah, let's, uh, I guess, not unless there's anything that you want to talk about. You just want to get to these last two matches, sir? Yeah, there's just a couple of things. Um, Soy, I think, from Evolution. I think she had a really good showing against Sayaka Karora. I quite like her. Um, she seems solid enough. Um, I know that she is in the Sendai Girls tournament that we were talking about last week with Rian and Aya Sakura, so I'm looking forward to seeing the, more of her. The Jar Jar Binks tournament. The Jar Jar Binks tournament. That <laughs> is absolutely correct, yes. Um, but yeah, I thought she was really good. Um, I thought she played a very good power person for Sayaka Karora to wrestle around. Um, Sayaka Karora, by the way, just her second career singles victory over Soy, and I just wanted to shout out Ichika Miyabi as well, because that match with Hanukkah was actually relatively good. It's it's not often that Hanukkah doesn't dwarf someone in terms of high, and it was quite interesting to see her wrestle someone who was equal in power as Ichika Miyabi is. Um, and this match is even more impressive when you consider the fact that this is only her second match back after missing nine months of action to undergo gender reaffirming surgery. So absolutely great stuff from Achika Miyabi. But yeah, let's get straight into uh, the Miyu match um, with Hina. Um, for the first part of this match, Hina is all, almost in complete control, isn't she? Yeah, I mean, this is oh, it's another great outing here from Hina, who's doing a great job building herself up. Again, considering the fact that we thought that she was a shoe in to uh, end her sister's legendary run as future stardom champion. So we're like, where are they going with Hina? Obviously, again, I think this is going to be building her up towards a high speed championship match. She gets a big pig and fall win in Cork and Hall, has a semi main event match and a great match with uh, Miyu Amasaki here. And again, it looks like Miyu Amasaki is. You know, we didn't realize this was a number one contenders match, but we'll get into that in a moment, partner. It looks so, yeah, like mean, yeah. I mean, a great outing from Hina. Even Miyu Amasaki was doing a lot of the high-speed stuff as well, so maybe somewhere down the road she'll challenge her Neo Genesis stablemate for that high-speed championship. I wouldn't say no to that. But, uh, yeah, really solid outing from Hina that uh, she did a great job building herself up, only for Miyu Amasaki to be able to hit the Tenzai 
for the three count, a really, really solid match that had me kind of on the edge of my seat for those last near falls. I didn't know which way they were going. I thought maybe Hina would get another win here to kind of, again, build herself up maybe for that hot, that's that shot at the high speed championship. And ultimately it was just the, uh, all the different variations of the DDT and the Tenzai for me, Yamasaki to pick up the win three and three fourth stars for me, partner. Yeah. I gave it three and a half for the exact same reason. You'd got sort of the dueling Hina targeting the back, looking for the modified jackhammer and the, the Gato clutch as well. Um, and me targeting the neck ready for the Tenzai. And it was really good. Actually, it's, it makes you realize just how much progress both have made um, and how much they've improved in such a short space of time that they're able to maximize the time that they're given. Um, Miu especially, I'm really impressed with the with the progress. And Hina as well. Hina doesn't get the credit she deserves because she's not on as many shows. Even as Rena, she's not on as many shows. So I feel like this was a really good spot for them to have. You mentioned, Matt, about Hina potentially being in the high-speed division. She is in that number one contendership, um, high-speed ro- uh, battle royal at Nagoya. So it'd be interesting to see if she's the one that comes out of it um, victorious. Um Future of Stardom Championship match. Um, Ice Cora, brand new gear, and to my mind at least, her best singles outing. I thought she was phenomenal here. Yeah, not only was this her best singles match, but they did a great job building up and teasing the finishes, not only from Ice Cora, but from Rena in their tag matches that we've seen over the past few weeks where you didn't know which way it was going to go because they planted the seeds in our heads that it's like, oh, maybe it could be the head kick. Maybe it can be a roll-up. Maybe it can be the triangle choke. Maybe it can be the hydrangea. They've done a great job building this match up. And then in the, as you're building towards the finish, you didn't know which way it was going to go. But Aya Sakura, yes, new gear. looks fantastic. Comes out of the blocks, not intimidated you know, at all does the double leg takedown and really gets full mile and really starts the punishing arena we're seeing arena on the back foot which we really don't see that much especially in these future stardom championship matches because of just again how many days she's been champion and how many successful title defenses that she that she has and again she's like one of the cool heels in the hate faction but i really really takes it to her eventually the arena is able to use her experience to dominate a little bit of is Sakura, and we do see a lot of fire and fighting spirit from is Sakura, uh, we get some really great stuff back and forth. Rena hit the diving knee bomb for a two count. Aya Sakura is able to eventually stack the jackknife for a 2.9 count that a lot of people thought that was going to be the finish and crowning a new champion. Then she uses that to a rolling R bar into the triangle choke, which again, we've seen Aya get some wins with. So a great job building that finish up. She has a huge spin kick for a two count, but eventually Rena is able to weather the storm, the late storm from Aya Sakura and lock in the hydrangea for the tap out. Three and three, four stars. For me, my friend, a uh, really, really good match to end this New Blood show. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree with the three and three-quarter stars. I think it was a great performance from Aya Sakura. Predictably good match for Rina. Um, I think the fact that Re- um, Aya Sakura had burned through the two ways that she defeated Rina in the first five minutes of the match, she'd already tried the triangle choke. She'd already tried the, the surprise roll-up as well it sort of played that story off of, right, she's run out of ideas here. What's she going to do next? And all Rena had to do really was wait her out and then lock in the hydrangea because it got to a point where Aya Sakura was almost playing for time as we neared the time limit because this went 14 minutes. So we were close to that time limit. Oh, no, we weren't. No, we weren't. It's a 30-minute time limit, isn't it, with the future belt? No, it is It is 15. I was right. It is 15. Um, Look at that. I was right. I don't know why I doubted myself. Um but yeah, I I did enjoy this match. I enjoyed Aya's performance. Rina has been phenomenal as um as future of Stardom champion. Of course, Miyu Amasaki comes out challenges next. That puts us um with our next challenger, which of course will take place in the Goya Golden Fight. Where do you, if you were a betting man, Matt, what is your opinion of this? Do you think that Miyu is the one to dethrone? Rena. We've said it for, you know, I don't think realistically either of us believed Aya had a chance. Horrible as that sounds, and I don't mean it to sound horrible. But do you think Miu is the one? Do you think that Rena 
can progress from the future of stardom championship scene now rob i'm gonna take your i'm gonna answer your question with a question we've been seeing these uh this future stardom championship defended in the main event of these new blood shows and we made mention about how the attendance isn't huge and uh we joked about them shutting the doors which again we were joking folks Mm -hmm. who is the bigger star that's going to be drawing more tickets arena or a new champion in Miyu Amasaki? I mean, it's a difficult question now because it's not like Rina has been a champion that everyone's bored of. She's been a dominant champion, a really good champion. She's had good matches. However, with Miyu Amasaki being part of Neo Genesis, who are a faction that everyone seems to love, I would argue that on the balance of probability, Miyu Amasaki would maybe at least initially draw more draw more uh, tickets. Yeah, because it's something new, very much like the Neo Genesis. Again, Arena's great champion, and she's doing a good job. 300, 326 people that they had in here. It's not a bad number. Again, considering the fact of how young she is, and it's, the, it's not the red belt. It's the future of Stardom Championship belt. And again, you don't have a, a Tam or Kamatan or Mayu on this show to help supplement that big championship match. I think the fact that, again, Rina, she's done everything with the spell she can. I think that if you put the belt on one Miyu Amasaki and then you have her main event, some of these new blood shows and considering again, the fact that Neo Genesis, the cool hot faction that you're basically just, you're going to capitalize on the momentum that is Neo Genesis. So um, I, again, obviously we're going to talk about it here in two or three minutes, but you're asking me for my pick. I think it's to be Miyu Amasaki, but again, the Hanako thing is there as well. So maybe you go there. Maybe Miyu has like a two, three month run with it. You know, not every run can be Han and not every run can be Rina. You know, you have to have the kind of those shorter runs there. Maybe this is one with Miyu Amasaki where it's like, Hey, you know, let's, let's capitalize on everything that's going to Neo Genesis. Again, Rina's Rina's done everything she can. Let's move her up the card into something bigger and better for her. Uh, let's, let's give Miyu a run with this belt. Let's see what she can do and go from there. So, I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do if they keep it on Rina, but it's like, gee, she, she's kind of coming after Tony Storm's V15 record with the SWA belt as the most successful title defenses in the history of stardom for one championship run. So there's that story you can play as well. That's a couple things that you can do, but the, I think me, you gets the win on Saturday, but I'm only like 55% sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm certainly more, um, confident that Miyu takes the belt than I was for Aya. That means nothing though, because as if we've proved nothing over the time of this podcast, it's that our predictions nine times out of ten are completely and utterly wrong. Um, just before we get into the press conference and the preview, then as we mentioned, and I didn't realize this, I texted Matt the other day. Was it yesterday? When I found out that Stardom actually had a Corican show tomorrow, I'd got no idea that this show was even happening. Um, that was this morning. Yeah, it was, that was this, it was this morning. morning. We're going back and forth. Yeah, it's, oh my God, it's on my daughter's birthday. I'm like, yeah, that's what her birthday present is the Corican Hall show that's got Tony Storm and Mike on it. So, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I've got no idea. I don't know how I'd missed this show, but there you are. It is another one of the Stardom Nighter in Corican Hall shows. So it's due to air at 6 30 p.m. Japan time, uh, which I think is 11 30 p.m. a.m. British Standard Time, which I think is 6 30 a.m. Eastern time, I believe. Um, but yeah, Corican Hall, in terms of ticket sales, um, front row seats are sold out, as are the women only seats. They've done these nighter shows twice, drew 700 the first time, drew over 1,000 the second time. I'm hoping that they get close to that 1,000 number. Obviously, we've got another Tony Storm appearance on this show as well. No title matches, however. So just to run through this card, we have um, Cosmic Angels in a tag team match. Tam Nakano and Aya Sakura taking on uh, Suzu Suzuki and Azumi of Neo Genesis. Um, in terms of a red belt preview, we have got a six woman tag for the future of stardom preview, which sees uh, Tomoka Inaba, Hina, and Miyu Amasaki taking on the hate team of Rina, Azusa Inaba, and Ruaka, which means we've got the Inaba sisters facing off with each other. Momokogo faces off with Momo Watanabe in singles action in the Momo name on a pole match. Um, we have got an eight-woman tag match, which seems the God's Eye team of Siori, Rani Yagami, and Lady C teaming with Diana's Nanami. Um, 
and she is replacing, of course, Saki Kashima, who is out injured, taking on the EXV team of Xena, Wax, Sukiyama, Rian, and Hanako. Tag team action, a preview of that singles match that we've got coming up. Fukuoka double crazy, Hazuki and Kagama taking on the Neo Genesis team of Starlight Kid and May Sarah. We've then got an eight-woman tag, which is a wonder of stardom preview and a single match preview for Sayaka Kurora and Sayaka Matani. Cosmic Angels team of Natsupoi, Sayaka Kurora, Sayoriano and Yuna Mizumori taking on the hate team of Natsuka Tora, Tekla Sayaka Matani and Konami. And then another IWGP Women's Championship preview match. Mayu Iwatani is joined by stars, members Hanan and Sayurida against the team of Tony Storm, Mina Shirakawa, and Micah. Um, Matt, a couple of questions. First things first, do you think they draw a thousand people or close to? Secondly, what matches are you most excited for? Um, and B, what do you think will be the match of the night? Because I know what I think match of the night will be, but what about you? Uh, let's go then, or do I do a thousand? It's on a Wednesday. That's a little tricky. However, Stardom is doing a pretty good job here. I'm going to say they get at low 900s yeah. would be my guess. I, I mean, if they can get a 1,000. I mean, even anything like 850 and above on a Wednesday. That with, again, no title matches. Again, because you're saving Wednesday everything. Wednesday evening Just, as well. Yeah, yeah. So Because you're saving everything for you know your big pay-per-view that you're hoping to do 18, 1900. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. For uh, for uh, for Saturday, so my guess is going to be somewhere around the 900s. But I think anything over 850 would be considered a massive success. Again, considering the fact that you're doing this on a Wednesday, so that would be uh, that would be my my deal. Uh, what was your? I know what the, the, the what was the, the second question, buddy. Um, what matches are you most excited for? Oh well, I think the match of the night is going to be that uh, the Starlight Kid and was it May Sarah she's teaming with? Yeah, it is. Yeah, versus FWC. I think that's going to be terrific again, considering the fact that you're just a few days removed of kind of firing Hazuki back up to the Hazuki mode that we love so well. That's going to be great. Um, I know we're going to see some more Tam Suzu violence. Um, I, I mean, I hope we see it. I hope we get it. I know we're going to get it. I hope it's not too violent where maybe one of these ladies doesn't make it to the show on Saturday because mm-hmm. going by the matches we reviewed last week, we're like, holy geez, uh, these two are going to light it up. And of course, Mayu teaming with Wing Gori to take on Mina, Mike and Tony Storm. That's going to be great. And considering the fact that, and I texted you this earlier today, considering the fact of how stardom had this card posted, it looked like. The Tam and Sayaka uh, t- uh, versus Suzu and Izumi match was going to be last. That like it was going to be the main event. I could be wrong, but it looked like that Tony Storm and Mayu uh, preview is like your opening match, like your free YouTube match, which would be absolutely really brilliant because ultimately you're building up Tam and Suzu. Like that's your big match with Mayu and Tony Storm, probably your semi-main event. That's going to a lot of draw a lot of eyes and ears again, especially with Walker Stewart doing the English commentary, which I'm so excited for. But like if you put that match on free on your YouTube, I think that's just a genius move. I really really do. So I don't know if that either goes for I think that match either needs to go first or it needs to go last, but those are the matches that I'm really looking forward to. And the fact that we're going to get a uh, Zusa versus Tomoka on opposite sides of a multi-person match is really, really intriguing for me. Again, what I think is going to be the best match is that Neo Genesis tag match versus FWC and Hazuki and Kagama, which again can, can kind of be kind of the spark that eventually gets Hazuki and Kagama to maybe, maybe after the match, they say, Hey, let, let's go for the, uh, to win the goddess tournament. Cause I think you're going to start seeing teams being announced and there's a possibility we always know on these big pay-per-views that after the second or third match, they have some big announcements. So I wouldn't be shocked if we're seeing uh, some uh, teams announced for the Goddess Tournament coming up at the end of this month. But ultimately, a really, really stacked show. And happy birthday, Lily, because for your birthday present, you get Suzu and Tam violence. I don't know what else a kid can want that's leaving her teens and going into her 20s than Tam and Suzu beating each other up on her birthday in Cork and Hall, buddy. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. It's what I would want for my birthday. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Something that... um, Let's let's move on then to the press conference, just because it sort of plays into um, the Hazuki and Starlight Kid match. So the press conference, there's a couple of notable things to come out of this press conference. All of them, bar one, 
Tony Storm. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about is <laughs> there was a Tokyo Sports interview with Starlight Kid where she just flat out says she hates Suzuki. Like, just flat out said she hates Suzuki. For basically because she left and then came back. Um, and they sort of piggybacked on that during the um, during the press conference with Hazuki saying, I hate you too. So we have gone from no build to a lot of build and a lot of fire and vitriol very, very quickly. And I think that is another thing that adds to this tag match in Corrigan. I think that we see a proper explosive Hazuki map. Yeah. Yeah, me and you just did alternate commentary not that long ago of Hazuki and Starlight Kid from the their match from the 2022 Five Star Grand Prix, which was a very underrated match in that great tournament. And I'm assuming we're kind of going to we're going to be seeing more of that come. Obviously, this Corgan show we're going to get a little bit sprinkle of that in in the tag match, but for the big tag ma- uh, the big singles match coming up uh, this Saturday, I think we're going to see that. And considering the fact that we have a revamped up Hazuki. And as good as Starlight Kid was two years ago, she's better now, which is crazy to say because, boy, howdy, she was great in 2022. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. And the fact that, again, Starlight Kid is very loyal to Star and was like, you left and came back and you won all this fanfare and you get all these – you had a red belt match. I've never had a red belt match before. I only had one shot at the World Wonder of Stardom Championship. You've had two of them since you came back and unsuccessful. So it's like – yeah, you kind of have that story story there as well, considering the fact that uh, they kind of are building a little bit more fire onto this. Where, like, last week it looked like it was Starlight Kid basically telling Hazuki, like, snap out of this and don't go to the dark side like I did back in 2021 because you're just going to get used and abused like how I did. But now we're adding another layer where it's like we don't like each other, but there's some respect there. I mean, there, there obviously has to be. So, yeah, that's a really, really interesting story. And this is interesting considering the fact that on these pay-per-views, Rob, usually the singles matches we get are title matches. We have two singles matches on this show that have really some cool implications. This match, and then Sakura and Sayakamatani. And then you're, we're adding on then four championship matches. So, again, it's really it's something different that they're doing. You know, it's like you can't always do the same old, same old. Let's kind of shake things up a little bit, which we've seen the start and booking committee do. Again, they're giving the, they give away the free the first match on these big shows free on YouTube. And considering the fact that some of the matches that we got Mina versus Kamatani a couple weeks ago, more than likely, I think on Wednesday, a match that's got Tony Storm versus Mayu in tag matches. Um, and now we've seen the fact that they have no problem having main eventers eating pinfalls on these Stardom World shows as long as it goes somewhere. Not as many time limit draws. Um, that's something different that the new brass of Stardom's been doing. And now the fact that we're putting on more singles matches that aren't championship matches on these pay per views is really, really intriguing. And obviously, this is one that can steal the entire show because we just know how damn good Hazuki is and how damn good Starlight Kid is. So, yeah, really interesting. And now we're adding on the layers of this press conference. And I just can't, I'm just, you know, I'm, I, I, kudos to you, buddy, the fact that you're picking something out that happened in the press conference. Other than Tony Storm, because boy, howdy, to quote what somebody does in a movie, because Tony Storm is a movie star, she's timeless. She really chewed up the scenery in this press conference. Goodness gracious me. Like, I don't know how you could possibly, like, it is so ridiculously unhinged, this promo, completely unhinged. Like, she's having an affair with Stan Hansen. <laughs> she's having to drink, like, chewing tobacco dribbled down her back. She's got thighs. Godzilla doesn't have her thighs. Mothra doesn't have her flaps. <laughs> she threw a shoe at Mayu, who then asks, is this for me? Can I take this home? Like, it's... I do not understand where she gets this from. But she is so so charismatic it's unreal Matt like it's such an unhinged promo but it's so damn good and the fact that she has got people in there who don't speak English and they're still laughing because of her delivery incredible stuff yeah and I don't I correct me if I'm wrong partner and we know this is a g-rated podcast so we're gonna bend that g to like uh to pg here in a minute 
But didn't she say something? She's taken a lariat from Stan Hansen and wasn't from his arms. <laughs> like, I think, she, like, like, and even in the, uh, I, I know in the press, the post press conference of Forbidden Door, she when she wrestled me, me to Shirakawa, she called her a big, beautiful breasted angel. And I think yep. in her feud with Diana Perazzo, she said something like, "You couldn't even hold my diaphragm." No, she said that about the belt. She twins. did say, "Yeah, like, I don't, I don't know. It had nothing to do with anything." So it's just like, again, we know she's a great wrestler, and if you go back and watch her promos in stardom when they would do the you know the, the pre-show promos they weren't that good but it's like ah eh, you know it's stardom they're known for the wrestling and she's a great wrestler but it's like you can put this up with that mina shirakawa promo that she did after she got injured in that match with saya kamatani and because that match was all passion that promo was mm-hmm. all passion out of nowhere where you did have like the funny the comedic but the stuff that was making sense but then you put the passion in the end where she said stan hansen told me that like i'm a foreigner in this country where she says, no, Mayu, you're a foreigner because you're in my ring. Even though the ring's in Japan, I was like, oh my God, she went from, and she does this in all of her promos. She went, she goes from like the comedic stuff. That's actually really funny. And I'm a giant fan of Stan Hansen as you are. And I just thought that was really, really hilarious. All the stuff she said, but then at the very end, she kicks straight serious and basically says, no, you're the foreigner. Because even though I'm in your country, you're in my ring. I thought that was a great it's line. A great and then she does. Line, yeah. It's a great line. And then she finishes the, the promo with her, with, with her catchphrase, throws the shoe at Mayu. And then did you see that when they were doing the photo at the very end yeah. with all the wrestlers that are in the big matches where Mayu was trying to stand on her tippy toes? Because Tony Storm is a little bit taller than Mayu, but then Tony had the bow in her hair. So it made Tony look even bigger. So Tony's trying to, or Mayu's trying to stand on her tippy toes so she looks taller than Tony. And Tony's just standing there like no selling it absolutely genius and again the fact that we knew that stardom always does these press conferences to build up for their pay-per-views and once tony storm was announced for the corkin show we just reviewed i was like okay there's no way she's going to corkin flying back to the states and then flying back all within seven days she's probably going to be there to be to do press and more than likely she is going to be doing press conference for her match with mayu and you know she's going to be in the timeless tony storm character and we know we're going to get a great promo But boy, howdy, that was great on so many levels. Buddy, I'm so excited for this match. I can't wait to see where this goes. I can't wait for this Cork and Hall show because there's a possibility she may cut a promo in the ring, and she should. Um, But that was, yeah, that was unhinged on so many levels in the best way. The wrestler, Tony Storm, was great. This timeless character, maybe the best character in Hall of AEW that we're bringing over to stardom. And I liked how, and I don't think we made mention of this, when she came on the screen after um, after the match with uh, eye contact defeating uh, Azumi and uh, Miyu Amasaki, O2 line, where she, made the, uh, where she made the challenge, where she was drinking wine in front of the fireplace. She said, I beat Mayu. For this red belt back in 2017, but because Mayu got injured, a lot of people didn't think that I deserved it. Yeah. So I need to go back to, to defeat Mayu. Now, little does anybody know, and obviously, you know, anybody long-term uh, fans of stardom, that actually Tony Storm rematched Mayu for that red belt. Tony Storm actually defeated Mayu in that V3 run, which, by the way, myself and Andy Header will be doing a review on Tony Storm's World of Stardom Championship run. That'll be free for everybody, because that's the kind of uh, fantastic people we are. But... Uh, Again, I liked how she's just like, I need to prove this. But then at the end of that promo was like, no, you're a foreigner because you're in my ring. What a great stuff. I'm so excited for this match. And again, just a great piece of pure pro wrestling with Mayu just not knowing what to do, which is so Mayu. I mean, you've raised another good point there with um, Tony saying that, you know, people thought it was a mistake. Mayu's never beaten Tony Storm in singles competition. I believe they've wrestled, they've either wrestled five times, Tony's got four wins and a draw, or they've wrestled four times and Tony's got three wins and a draw. And I can't remember off the top of my head, but I can remember that Mayu has never beaten Tony Storm in singles competition. So there's also that on the line as well, which is really interesting. Um, let's look ahead at this card then before we uh, before we get into anything else i've already gone through the card but uh we'll go through match by match give our predictions and things there is one change of course and that is that the high speed championship five person battle royale is now a five person battle royale um with saki kashima not being fit to take part she's also been pulled from this card as well as the corrigan hall show as well 
So that is going to be between Rani Yagami, Yuna Mizumori, Momokogo, Hina, and Kogama. Now, of these five wrestlers, only two have ever gone for the high speed title before in Momokogo and Kogama, and only one of them has ever won the high speed title. That, of course, being the high speed genius, Kogama. Matt Turner, they've got a choice here where they can either go in a completely different direction and build someone in the future division. Uh, sorry, the high speed division. Or you go with a tried and tested someone like a Kogama who you know you're going to get a fantastic match out of, even a Momokogo who's done it before. Who do you think wins this? Who do you think is going on to face Maysera? You know, you're right, Robin. All five of these wrestlers in a high speed match with Maysera, they all would be great. So there's really no wrong answer here. Um, as far as like match quality goes, your best bet is probably May versus Kogama. But at the same time, I think maybe you should build somebody else up. Um, again, you can do that. That's not a problem. And what a feather in the cap it would be for May Sarah to defeat one of the best wrestlers in the history of the division uh, in this second run that she are in this run that she's having with the high speed championship. But I'm going to say, and I'm again, this is I'm shot at the dark here, just because I talked about how great she was in these high speed style matches. These two shows we just reviewed. I'm going to say Hina is the one that wins it. You said it's a battle royal, so it's like it's over the top, right? I believe so, yes. I guess we'll find out Saturday morning, but I'm going to say Hina, buddy. You're going to say Hina. Um, I mean, it's an interesting one. I think it could go Hina. Um, however, I, you know, they've got Historic Crossover 2 coming up, and I wonder if. I don't think they'll put a title match, a high-speed title match on that card. But if you're building eyes towards stardom, going with Kagame. However, I am going to go with Momo Kogo because I think she deserves a bit of the spotlight because she's great. Um, metal. You mean metal Momo Kogo. Thrash metal Momo, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which could be the next shirt. Um, yeah, so I think Momo Kogo, um, in, just going back to what you said, ages ago about them doing uh, announcements on the pay-per-view i think we do get announcements in regard to uh to the goddess of stardom tag league i think we could also get something to do with historic crossover as well um so we, now we have got a four-way tag match um uh, mace aaron azumi versus sack Kuro and seoriano seori and lady c and wingori I believe this is probably the tale of two teams. I think you're looking at either Wingori or Neo Genesis, Matt. What do you think? Again, we got the Goddess Tournament coming up here. I think it'd be a good way to get some steam behind Wingori. So I'm going to say Wingori takes it. I think that's a great idea. I think that's a great idea. I, I, I completely agree with you. I think Wingori. Oh, I believe a cat is appearing. At the thought of yeah. Wingori. Yeah. They're excited. They love the, your cats. Love them some Saida as as and some not- wish me happy go sun si- go sunshine. <laughs> so long as there's no bird attached to it this time. Uh-huh. Coco, beware! <laughs> Is it? No, it's fine. We're okay. We're okay. There's no bird. Um, We're at the end of the podcast anyway, buddy. We're getting towards the end. <laughs> that's true. We are near the end. Um, Sayaka Kuro and Sayaka Matani. Then. Um, uh, I think this only goes one way. Um, as as good as the uh, the feel good win for Sayaka Karora, she's not beating Sayaka Matani. Well, you would think so, buddy. I'm agreeing it's Kamatani, but when this match was first announced, I'm like, ah, I'm ninety percent sure it's Kamatani. The more I thought about it, the more it dropped down to like sixty five, seventy percent because you got a really cool story. Wouldn't it be the worst thing in the world to have another upset and have Sayakura defeat Sai Kamatani on a big show like this? Again, I'm going with Kamatani, but it would not shock me if they just if they go back to back with Sayak. Again, you're making a new star. Sai Kamatani is already there, right? She's already there. She's going to be there for as long as she needs to be. This will be a big, big feather in the cap of Sayakura. Even though what, that that being said, it's going to be Sai Kamatani that gets the win. Just, this is going to be a great, great match. Probably Sayaka Kuroa's best match ever. And I think Sayaka Kuroa, her debut match was that New Blood versus Kamatani, was it not? Yes, I believe so. Yes, it was. Yeah, so you kind of have that underlying story. 
And again, is Sayaka going to be the, able to one to pull the evil out of Kamatani, or does it go the other way and we see heal Sayaka? I don't know. It's going to be a really good match, and I'm really interested at the underlining story that they have going into this and coming out of it as, as well. Hazuki versus Starlight Kid then in a match that Starlight Kid wants to be sort of an uh, an impromptu wonder of stardom number one contendership match. Um, this is a really interesting one. I think with that added sort of stipulation, I think Starlight Kid takes it because I agree. We've we've built Hazuki back up. I think. Natsupoi needs some defenses before we inevitably put the belt on Hazuki. I don't want to revisit that just yet. So have Natsupoi defeat Tekla, then have Starlight Kids come out. Can you imagine that match on Historic Crossover if that's where they choose to do it? Natsupoi versus Starlight Kid. Like, talk about matches that are going to draw fans into stardom. Good grief, that's your match right there. Whether that's where they do it, I don't know. Or whether they do it at Korokan or whether they do it at the Goddess Finals, I don't know. But I don't want to build Hazuki up just yet. You've had the entire storyline of how damaging a loss has been to her. Don't build her back up to immediately throw her back into that scene. Wait now. Either wait till Sumo Hall or wait till April for your big show in the spring. For me, it has to be Starlight Kid. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And they kind of were teasing some Starlight Kid and Natsupoi stuff yeah, exactly. at the shows. We were... So again, we got little traces there, and what a better way to build Starlight Kid up than to wrestle. You know, if she she's going to go after the Wonder of Stardom champion, she needs to defeat one of the best Wonder of Stardom wrestlers of all time, even though she's never won the never belt. Won before. the belt. And in Hazuki uh, again, this is going to be another great match on this loaded show. But I I agree with you. I think Starlight Kid gets the win here, and I think it's more important. Hate versus two. Oh, I'm sorry. To further the story. No, no, you're right. Sorry, I had to further the story. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Now, you broke up, so I thought you'd finished. I apologize. Um, hate and Dump Matsumoto and Zap versus EXV. I do think that the chances are it'll be Hate and the Villainous Alliance that win this, um, uh, simply because promotion for Dump Matsumoto, isn't it? Yeah, and this is different than the show we always say we're not going to talk about from last October, but I guess we're talking about it because there's a lot more steam behind Dump Matsumoto because of everything going on with the Netflix show. There's a lot and more I have wrestlers in the it. ring, Matt. That's the most important yes. thing. That's what I was going to get to because I think it was just a straight-up tag. Wasn't it Dump and Zap versus Mean and Waka? It was indeed, yeah. Okay, so yes, you have a lot more moving. Point. And you have Mean and Waka in this match. So again, they, and I talked about it last year, they did everything they possibly could to make that match somewhat enjoyable. And God bless Mina and Waka. So they're on the opposite side. You're absolutely right. You do have a lot more moving with more more moving parts, a lot more wrestlers. So you can have Zap and Dump Matsumoto do their gimmick. Again, this match is going to draw tickets because of everything that's going on with a Netflix show with one Dump Matsumoto. It's, it's a gimmick match. Let's call it like we see it at the same time. You got Momo Watanabe on that team. You know, is there ever, other than Mayu, has there been a more consistent wrestler in stardom in the last five years than Momo Watanabe? She's going to be great. You have Mike and Mina on the other side. Not only that, but from like the way that I look at this as a wrestler in this match, if I'm on either opposite, if I'm in this match, whether I'm on the baby faces or the heels, Dump Matsumoto is arguably the greatest heel Joshi when it comes to drawing tickets and actual heat ever. I'm picking this lady's brain. I'm talking, I'm asking, like, I would ask her how to set stuff, stuff up in this match, stuff to plan during the match and after the match. I would pick Dump Matsumoto's brains so much. So, again, are we getting Dump Matsumoto from 1985? No, absolutely not. You're absolutely right. We can mask this match with all the other great wrestlers that are around here. But this is an opportunity for the Ruwakas, the Momo Watanabis, again, even the Mean and the Waka on the other side, to pick the brain of one of the greatest drawing heels in the history of Joshi wrestling on how to do certain things. I hope everybody takes advantage of that and they become better wrestlers as far as getting certain heat and correct heat at certain times like Dump Matsumoto did 
Um, as far as who's going to win, yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. I think the heels get the win here. Again, you're taking advantage of what is going on with the Netflix show with uh, Dump Matsuma, which hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be doing a review with Alice in Danger. That's another story for another day. But uh, yeah, I totally agree with you, my friend. Moving on then to our four title matches, we have got Mai Iwatani versus Tony Storm. As good as this match will be, I do think Mayu retains, if only because I think Mayu and Azumi is the program going forward. And I think Mayu drops it to Azumi. Yeah, I agree. I think this match is going to be terrific. This is going to be one of, uh, you know, a really coming out party for Tony Storm for the people that forgot that she can go with any wrestler uh, at any time, at any speed. And Mayu, again, she's on the run of her life partner. But I totally agree. I think it's going to be a Mayu win. Uh, and then I think eventually it's going to be a Zoomy, whether it's going to be at Sumo Hall or the Tokyo Dome or maybe the anniversary show at the beginning of next year. Uh, I don't know. But, yeah, I totally agree that Mayu gets the win here. And what's going to be an absolutely fantastic match that was built up so perfectly by one Tony Storm. Future of Stardom Championship, then. Rina versus Miyu Amasaki. I mean, this could go one. This is this is the hardest one to call for me of the entire match, of the entire card, sorry, this is the hardest one because I can physically see it going either way. I'm going to take a punt and say Miyu Amasaki. But it would not surprise me if we see Rina retain and Hanako come out. What about you? Uh, you got, yeah, I mean, you got a really, really good outing there with Rina getting the win and having Hanako come out. But I'm going to say it's going to be Miyu Amasaki. But we've been saying that Rina's been dropping that belt for the better part of three months. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, just for the, uh, if you want my official prediction, it's Miyu Amasaki. But yeah, again, I mean, this is flip a coin on this one. Semi main event then, Nat Sapoy versus Tekla for the Wonder of Stardom Championship. Tekla never having gone for the Wonder of Stardom Championship before. This will be Nat Sapoy's second successful title defense. Something is brewing in regard to this match. What it is, I don't know. But whatever it is, I still think Nat Sapoy retains because I think the ultimate story is Nat Sapoy and Hazuki. That's my opinion. Whether that is how it plays out, I don't know. But Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. Ultimately, your end game is going to be Suzuki and not Sapoy. Uh, again, whether that's at the end of the year, sometime next year. And then I think your your story moving to the next month or two is not Sapoy versus Starlight Kid. That's going to be another big drawing match for you. Um, for you, I mean all of us and stardom. But um, yeah, the Tekla thing is, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident that not Sapoy pick. But the Tekla underlining story where she's like cheering Natsupoy on is really, really interesting. And I'm really looking forward to see how that part of the story unfolds. I think this is going to be another great match for Natsupoy. This is going to be Tekla's best match. This is going to be the match where Tekla shows to everybody that you can put her in a big, big time match on a load of card like this. And she can absolutely deliver. I would be shocked that when we review this show next week that we don't say that, was, that wasn't that was Tekla's best match. Because I think it's going to be the... I mean, considering the fact of how great she's been especially this new heel, heel character, how violent she's been. We know that Natsupoy can work that style and work that style very, very well. So you watch her matches with Shuri. Um, I think that this is going to be Tekla's best match ever. I think I, I can't see you being wrong in that, my friend. And then moving on to your main event or what is listed currently as the main event. And again, should be the main event. Um, uh, Tam Nakano defending her World of Stardom Championship against Suzu Suzuki. Really interesting, these two in the press conference as well. Tam apologizing to Suzu that their match never happened and feeling that Suzu's resentment towards her for that match not happening is going to ultimately cause her, cause Suzu to lose the match. And I think, you know, Tam then piggybacking on top of that and saying, look, I've been at the lowest of the low this year and I've scratched and crawled and I've won the top prize. You know, that is what this belt means to me. I think Tam retains. I think it's going to be a very good match and I think it's going to be a very violent match, which I'm very excited for. But I feel there are other challenges for Tam and I think this is going to be a great match. I don't think Suzu wins though. 
No, I totally agree. I mean, we're on the Tam Road part two here. This is a great story considering the fact this match was the match we were supposed to get last year with Tam being Red Belt champion and Suzu winning the five star. We're able to revisit this match and they did a great job building this match up. And I'm sure the match in Cork and Hall coming up uh, again Wednesday on the second is going to build it up even better considering the fact how violent these two have been on these tag matches leading up. I think this is going to be terrific. It's going to be violent in all the best ways possible. But I totally agree. I think Tam outlasts Suzu. And I think even with Suzu with the loss, we're going to see that Suzu Suzuki is a constant main eventer in this stacked roster that is starting. But ultimately, yeah, I totally agree. I think Tam gets the uh, gets the win here. So final thing, really, um, just looking at the show itself. So it's emanating from IG Prefectural Gymnasium. It's a show they have run, or a venue, sorry, that they've run four times. Um, and three of those four times, they've drawn over 1,300 people. Um, drew 13, uh, 1,306 for Nagoya Supreme Fight, 1,353, which is currently the highest for the venue, um, for Stardom at Stardom X Stardom 2022. Nagoya Golden Fight, which you'll remember was Tam versus Natsuka Tora, 1, 315 big dip for the last time that they ran the venue which was for nagoya big winter which was suzu and hazuki for the right to challenge contract that only drew 952 matt turner if you were a betting man and obviously i don't know the full capacity of this venue but do you think we get closer to the 1353 people or would you think more conservatively I think this. I think they break it. I think they get to fourteen, fifteen hundred. Again, you got Tam in the main event. You got Mayu and Tony Storm. Uh, you got Dump Matsumoto. Um, you know, coming off the Netflix thing. I think that you have a lot of really cool, interesting, moving parts. The fact that Stardom is doing really, really well on drawing, and you got a, a big, big show like this. You know, Tekla Natsupoy. I think that this one's going to do about fifteen, sixteen hundred. Be my I guess. It's interesting. I I do think it'll be one of the bigger ones that they've done. How big? I don't know. But I do think that we are going to be close to, if not breaking the attend the stardom attendance record at the venue. If I'd have done a little bit more research, I could have told you what the uh, what the record attendance is in terms of wrestling at the venue, but I didn't because I'm only human. Um, Matt Turner, with the uh, lack of EO and Kyrie watch, uh, that does bring us to the end of our episode today. Thank you so much to everyone for listening along to our preview. Most of all, I hope that you enjoy the Corrigan Hall show tomorrow or have enjoyed it because that will have happened in the past when this comes out in some sort of weird time paradox. Um, I hope you enjoyed the pay-per-view and we'll be here to review that same time, same place next week. In the meantime, guys, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget, you can find us on all podcasting platforms. If you thought we've done a good job, it'd be great if you could leave us a five-star review and a comment. It just helps us be exposed to even more people. Don't forget to check out the website as well, www.thestarmcast.com for all of your news, reviews, archive podcast episodes, stats and statistics and records from Stardom and from Marigold as well. Um, don't forget on page if you want to hear all these episodes early and ad free you can join our patreon patreon.com forward slash the stardom cast for as little as one dollar a month you can find us on all social media at the stardom cast and you can talk to me on twitter at real rob goodwin matt turner where can they find you and then sign us off good sir absolutely folks questions comments suggestions you want to chat with me during this fantastic pay-per-view Best way to get a hold of me is Matt Turner OF on the Instagram and or the Twitter. The email address, if you want to shoot me an old fancy email, the stardomcast22 at gmail.com. Folks, that's going to wrap it up for another fantastic episode. Hope you enjoyed this episode as much as me and one Mr. Rob Goodwin. Enjoy talking all the fantastic stuff going on in the world of stardom and trying to get free jerseys shipped to us over here in the United States and England, respectively. Uh, folks, we greatly appreciate your support. Can't do it without you. Because like I always say, it's just not my podcast. It's our podcast. As well as together, everyone's different. Everyone's special. <laughs> <laughs>